recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. We have one apologies, I believe the Lord Mayor might be running late, but we have Councillor Hyde um, as an apology. Um, members, today we have three items um, within a workshop and um, acting CEO, yes. Thanks, Chair. Just before we begin, I just want to clarify the format of the workshop. Are we allowed to speak freely um, or is it just a question and answer session? Well, what the administration is looking for, are they looking for guidance? Um, so constructive um, feedback would be required in regards to making sure that they receive the proper so, information. So we can speak, forward. it's not just ask questions. Well, you can, but you have to be mindful that you're not entering into debate. So then it's just, if we can't debate, we're not allowed. So we, we can only, uh, well, how, we can you, how can we speak on the topic? Count, Councillor debate? Sims, what we're looking for is constructive feedback and, and guidance for administration, as in every workshop, that's what they look for. But if you're looking at to make a, an opinion in regards to and debate it, then that's not what we're not looking for at this present moment. This is a workshop, so they're looking for feedback and they need direction. So this is a very important workshop because it is something that administration really need guidance on, okay? So feedback, but not two-way debate. Well, no, this is not the chamber. We're not looking for a debate. We're looking to work together and hopefully tonight we can all work collaboratively together to give administration some guidance. But how can we give guidance without giving a flagging our vote? Because we're not asking for a vote here, Councillor Moran, we're just asking for administra administration to have feedback. Well, you can't flag what you will be looking at voting on when you are in chamber, but you certainly can offer feedback in regards to how they can structure their reports for future referencing that you can vote on at the chamber. Does that make sense? So you can give feedback so they can structure the reports for the future so you can vote on in chamber. It's a very, very confusing format. Are we here to debate this topic? Well, they're, uh, they're allowed to ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm ha happy to clarify, I'm happy to clarify the format for tonight's workshop, but as I specified, this workshop is really, really important, so please offer your feedback to administration. That's what we're looking for tonight. Acting CEO. Thank you, Deputy Law Mayor and Chair. Um, so yes, as the Deputy Lord Mayor has said, so tonight we've got three pieces of work where we're looking for your thoughts and feedback and guidance in relation to three really important elements um, of the uh, Council's financial sustainability. So firstly, we've got the 10-year long-term financial plan um, and we have Grace and Nicole here to work us through that. Then we also have um, the business plan and budget, which obviously brings you to the here and now, um, and we're looking for your thoughts around how we might construct um, the uh, budget for the next financial year. And then a piece of work that's been in train for some time, and it's your first opportunity as council members to have a look at those um, long-term strategic asset management plans. That forms the overarching structure um, of how um, this council wants to manage its strategic assets. Um, and then further down the track, you'll have an opportunity um, to have a close, deep look um, at the um, asset plans associated with delivering on, on that. Um, obviously, from a um, city perspective, um, as we shared with you at QF2 just recently, the city isn't nearly back to where it was pre-COVID. Um, we do have the Fringe and Festival on at the moment, so there is higher footfall. But from a revenue perspective, we're still feeling the impacts um, of, uh, of COVID on our city. Um, and there's still, um, I think, a, a long tail in terms of how 
um, this council supports um, the city into the future. So whether that's through attracting people back into the city or whatever this council chooses to do, um, we'll be keen tonight just to get some ideas and suggestions from you in relation to that. Um, I'd also like to formally welcome Justin and Grace. So Justin and the COO will obviously have some um, fresh eyes that he has brought to how we uh, present our information to you and how we structure our conversations with you from a financial management perspective, so that's great. And we've got Grace Pell here who joined us two weeks ago, very experienced local government and private sector financial manager who's also within two weeks brought a fresh set of eyes to our finances and has already given us some really good um, feedback and direction in relation to how we might um, absolutely become a more financially sustainable organisation. So I will at this point hand over to Grace and Nicole to take us through the first, oh sorry, to Justin who just wanted to yeah. say a few words as well. Thank you CEO. Um, good evening uh, councillors and uh, members of the gallery. Um, we're here to present the uh, uh, annual business plan, uh, the uh, annual business plan, and also the long-term financial plan. Uh, but we also have a session with Matthew Holmes as well. So Matthew, uh, as you know from uh, our manager of uh, strategy and insights, will also be part, part of that conversation. But we'll lead you through that. I wanted to briefly summarise the next two presentations, which are under me, um, with a three-point health check, if I could, just to get us get us thinking. The first point I'd make is that we're living beyond our means. We're not living within them. And a few comments about that is the annual recurring budget hasn't been in surplus for years. 2016-17, I think was the last time that was the, the case. And there's a host of reasons for that. And you would have seen in the full pack that you received uh, the, the uh, list of reasons why that is the case. And COVID has come along and exposed some of our weaknesses. And we all know that certainly from a revenue perspective, certainly from a business perspective, which uh, council is heavily dependent upon. And uh, also the uh, visitation to the city. The city has made it fluctuate, but some of Tom's crew have, have kept up the, uh, the, the the money coming in from a parking perspective, which is which has uh, helped us enormously. The third uh, idea I put there is that if we achieve a, a yearly surplus, or at least break even, which is what the uh, order direction has been, uh, we'll get better options to manage the community in the future, to, to deliver what they want, and also thinking about future generations as well. We need to keep them in mind in terms of who's carrying the load for existing infrastructure and future infrastructure. Second point I'd make is that we're not saving enough for a rainy day. Our asset renewals in later years, you would have seen in the pack, uh, are coming up short. And, and so our long-term financial plan must be fully funded and we must be able to uh, renew those assets in, the, in a like-for-like in a -like manner. Uh, as soon as we start upgrading assets and buying new ones, that's a, that's a different story and that's a, a decision of council. But um, also I'd say that we can certainly improve our asset management and there's a lot of that, ha that has gone on to cleanse the data that they've got, make better decisions, but it is an ongoing task. And uh, I think one of the areas that we really want to focus on is the carry forwards for projects and the, what they call WIP, you know, the work, work in progress for, for projects. And I know Clinton is, is right on that, uh, but there's, there's effort to be made in that sort of area as well. And the third point I'd make that our borrowings are too high, um, and that was point out, pointed out ably in our pack and picked up by the, by the advertiser. Uh, so $90 million now and rising to $150 million in the projections in 2030. Big, big numbers. So the dis discipline of having surpluses is a really good one and it can reduce the servicing of our debt and we need to get to that sort of position. Um, we can borrow for good debt, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, we can you know, put up a business case to increase our income and uh, find that we actually get involved in things which are generating cash and that lessens the burden on, on rate pay, so that's, that's important. And we can manage our debt better. I think there's obvious op opportunities with the future fund in terms of the sales and purchases there as the what gets bought, when it gets sold, all sorts of other management decisions. So those three three things, not living within our means, not saving enough money for a rainy day, and borrowing too high, may, uh, our borrowings being too high may sound a bit gloomy, uh, and it points to some hard decisions ahead. I don't want to sort of say that you know, everything is covered tonight. There are still some tough decisions ahead, uh, but this is not a decision-making workshop. I'll 
hasten to add, um, as do the local government act. Uh, but we can certainly fix this together. So uh, uh, I would also like to recognise up until this point that the effort that has gone into uh, resurrecting the situation with the 18.2 million that has been saved already and a lot of work from councillors and, uh, and staff together. But what we can't do in this workshop, I think, is blame each other or point fingers. I think that's going to be counterproductive. That won't certainly won't help us move forward at all. So, um, so if we can get that out the road, that that'll be welcome. And if we can work the plan and stick to the plan. So let's have a look at the plan, work it up, get it right, and then stick to it. That will help us in in the future. So that's my summary, and, and it, which is a weird way to start. Really, you do summaries at the end. I've done it at the start, but I thought that'd be helpful in terms of giving us context in terms of where, where we're heading. Grace is going to unpack that for you, and Nicole as well will drive drive the show. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Grace. Thank you, through the chair. Thank you, councillors. Um, so the focus of the first presentation is going to be around the long-term financial planning. Um, the long-term financial plan is um, exactly as it suggests. It does have that long-term view and it is built on one key assumption around the fact that you are going to ensure financial sustainability in all the decisions that you're making. All the assumptions that are put into the plan are based on sustainability parameters and some of those things you've already discussed. Um, but essentially, um, financial sustainability is at the core of what the plan is all about. Um, you can make the decisions in the here and now, um, but without understanding the impact of what those decisions are in the long term um, is, you know, the effect that you, you'll feel maybe not in the next year, but or not in this term, but in the next term or for the next generation. So some of those things you may be starting to feel now, um, but it's about what we do with the decision making now to make sure we um, get to that financial sustainability every time we're making a decision. Um, financial sustainability is a term I think that we throw around a lot and expect people to understand what that actually means. Um, however, I think it does, um, I think, take a little bit to really sort of unpack what it is and understand what it means, especially when we're talking about making sustainable decisions. So. Um, the LGA offers a, um, a nice sort of definition around this. The LGA has uh, sustainability papers written around this as well, so which are you know, freely available on their website and offers definition around what long-term um, financial sustainability is. Um, it is really around where in more periods than less, in a long-term period, um, you are sustainable, which is ironic in the sense that that's the definition, but um, the that basically means that in, a, in that sort of period, you're able to pay your way for services. So to use Justin's term around living within your means, that's exactly what it means. It doesn't mean sort of spending beyond your means, but again, I'll refer to the more periods in, in, um, in less. So, you know, it's okay to maybe experience a blip as we have with COVID, could have been helped. Um, but the idea is that if we're sustainable, we can maintain a few years like that. Um, the second part of the definition of sustainability, so not only is it about paying your way through, but it's also about being able to manage your investment into the city so as not to burden the current generation or overburden the future generation. So it's about spreading it across the generations that are going to um, be able to reap the benefits of those uh, investments made so that no one generation has to pay more than the other to reap the benefits of those investments into the city. So um, when you're trying to uh, sort of understand what sustainability is all about, and we'll see a little bit of a graphic about this um, in a few slides, for me, I always think of balance. So it's about balance in terms of the balance of the decision that we're making now in terms of profit. Um, we're making sure that we're funding everything that we're putting into um, our city, the investments that we're putting into our city, and are we balancing it out over the long term to make sure that this generation and the next generation are paying fairly and equitably um, for those investments. So um, if we if we kind of extend that out a little bit, I guess, into something that I think is uh, an example you know, that we may relate to. I think it's more around like if we have an investment property and we think about um, growing that investment property each year, we don't think about just the cost of growing that investment property, but also where the funding for that 
investment, initial investment is coming from, but also what the funding is to pay for that ongoing investment, to maintain it at a certain level, to make sure that the next tenant, if we want to think about it as investment property, is not paying for you know future developments and things like that. So it's about thinking about every decision as an investment into this city and making sure that we're, we're spreading that burden fairly. So when I, um, I guess, break the financial sustainability down, there are three areas that we focus on or that I focus on every time we're making a decision. What's the impact on our operating performance in terms of our surplus? So quite often we'll always consider the expenditure side of things and not necessarily consider where the funding is coming from for those expenditures. The same um, with uh, effective debt management. So debt management as um, Justin alluded to is really around um, making sure that we, we continue to uh, invest in our city, which may mean taking on good debt, but it's not about taking on bad debt. And there is such a thing as bad debt, but not all debt is bad. So um, debt if, is, is a really effective intergenerational equity tool. Um, and remember when sustainability is, a try, is trying to apportion the burden across generations, then debt is a really effective tool to do that. What you don't want debt to be incurred for is just to maintain your operations on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll show you some, there's some graphs included in your pack and I'll show you on the next slide um, where there's instances where that's happened. So, and there's some instances in the future in this current long-term plan that shows where that will happen again. So we need to be mindful about when those decisions occur, what creates those, those um, negative cash flows, if you like, as to you know, how we can offset those with the decisions you make to make sure that the, the decision is balanced and therefore every time we're considering a debt decision, we're also considering where the funding is coming from for that debt. Um, so that's, I'll go into that a little bit more when I can get to the next slide. Um, the third focus area for me is around um, managing your asset renewals and your asset growth. So it is one thing for us to maintain every single asset in the city. Again, that needs to be funded, but also we want to be able to continue to grow the city. I don't think we want to stay stagnant in terms of like the, the investments that we're putting into the city. So again, that growth should be enabled with effective financial management and when we are making more balanced uh, decisions around where the funding is coming from. Again, using the effective debt for that, but also make sure we're able to afford that and fund that going forward, which again, touches on um, Justin's comments around how we manage debt going into the future. So there are several levers, levers available to council if we actually think about how we're going to um, effectively manage our debt in, or our operations in those three areas. Um, there is the traditional let's increase rates revenue. Um, it is a, is a traditional and a, and a bit of a go-to. Um, however, it is not your only means of, and it is not your only lever. So there is obviously others that are available. Um, we can seek new revenue generating um, activities. We can continue to monitor expenditure and, and deliver cost efficiencies. There is a point though um, that if we, if we have a series of unbalanced decisions where those sorts of levers become ineffective and then you're in this situation where you're having to find significant wholesale change. So these sorts of levers are around balancing and maintaining sustainability. When you're trying to return to same sustainability, it is a bigger effort which is, um, I think, where we are now. So um, the, uh, the, the other part or the other lever available for us is to make sure we understand what our clear funding pathways are. There is multiple funding pathways, again, not just rates income, um, to make sure that we avoid those circumstances where we're spending without um, being able to pay for it or where we're incurring bad debt and having no means to pay for that either. Um, JP will talk later to the strategic asset management plan and you'll hear about some of the levers there when it comes to our asset renewals and new assets which um, you know are just there's natural synergies and and connectivity between our asset management and long-term plans that have to be funded and therefore um, those levers uh, kind of cross over each other and uh, when we do effective asset management and asset renewal and we can fund that then um, that assets actually become an effective funding lever as well. So JP will go um, into that a little bit more.
And um, so this is the slide that I was um, sort of talking about in terms of shows you a little bit of history um, and I'll kind of probably caveat this with this is what I kind of had to start with being two weeks into this job, just going into the City of Adelaide data and, and seeing um, what are the numbers tell me. So I'm kind of formulating a bit of a, you know, a bit of a story about that um, in terms of how did we get here or what is this made up of sort of thing. So, um, which is, is always important to have that bit of context, but I can't provide you the context on, on the decisions made to date because obviously I wasn't a part of them. But I guess my focus is really around how do we make sure that the future decisions are sustainable. So what this, um, this uh, slide shows you is basically the output of the current long-term financial plan, which as Justin said, has the um, borrowings growing from the current sort of level of 90.3 million up to 149 in year 10. Now that is obviously based on lots of inputs and assumptions which are provided to you in the reading pack. And I'll ask you in a, in a couple of slides times to whether we want to test any of those or change any of those. Um, but you will notice that that slide or that particularly the borrowings does present quite green, which looks quite happy and, and fine um, in terms of it's all within prudential limits. Um, I guess I just kind of would, um, you know, basically say just because it's within that prudential limit, it doesn't mean we don't need to manage it. We still need to manage it. So um, there is another key assumption that's in the long-term financial plan, which essentially means, uh, which essentially is past 23, 24. Um, the long-term financial plans assume that you're not going to do any new developments. Um, there is nothing new in there. All basically you'll be doing is running the same services, renewing assets, and that is it. Um, I think, you know, it probably won't be, um, you know, the, the most realistic position. It's just that in those out years, it's hard to predict what those longer term new capitals are. Um, and, and so that's partly why it presents in the green in those out years. So we, again, need to be mindful of the fact that whilst it's a 10 year financial plan, the 10 year plan in the outer years does become a little bit greater. So relying on the fact that we're going to get in the green by year eight, seven, eight, nine or 10 um, is not, you know, is not always reliable. So um, the operating position does show you a bit more of a picture around where we're going to be, particularly in the first three or four years in terms of we will still be in slight deficits. You are, I know we have got the assumption around achieving break even um, this year. We're going to work through more of that tonight and how we're going to get there. And um, Nicole and Matt will take you more through that. Um, however, again, based on the parameters and the assumptions that are in the plan, it's not necessarily a uh, break even for the next three years straight away. So again, this is the importance of sustainability when we're talking about balanced decision making is because what we may put in place now, doesn't, whilst it will translate into the future, it doesn't mean there's not more work to be done. So it's a bit of a journey to get where we are now. It's the same, it's the same and maybe even a longer journey to come into a more balanced position. So what the two graphs show you um, is really around uh, how we kind of got here. So that first one around borrowings uh, shows you sort of the, the impact of or what we've borrowed for, I should say. So um, whether it's been uh, community investments, income generating as, um, assets to borrow for uh, subsidiary operations or to borrow from the cash flow from, for the operations. So that cash flow from operations, that dark blue line, that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. So that one there basically shows you that we are borrowing to operate. Um, that's bad debt by translation. We are borrowing to can keep the basic sort of ongoing services um, going. So that's the line that we want to disappear. Um, it's okay, again, in terms of good debt to make sure you're borrowing for your income generating assets because there, again, there's a natural funding pathway for those. Um, it's definitely okay to borrow for community assets. Again, as long as it's funded debt, we can make sure we spread that across generations and um, we can still deliver the investment and growth to the city. But that cash flow from operations is the one that starts to become um, a little bit concerning and the one that we need to, to manage. Um, the operating position table or slide there will tell you, uh, just tell you a bit of a picture around um, the operational expenditure in the last few years exceeding operational income. Um, again, that's that concept of living beyond your means. Um, again, while it's okay in a year, in one year, where you may have an exception like a COVID, um, you don't want that to continue on a long-term ongoing basis. 
So again, this is this is the sort of pattern that's that's emerging is around every time we're making the decision, we're going to think about the long-term effects. Those decisions that have been made, we may be only seeing the effects of decisions made in the last few years now. Right? So then equally, whatever decision we're making now this year, we may feel that for a few more years, which is why it takes us a few years to kind of come out on the other side. Can we have questions at the end? Oh, yeah. or, okay. Sorry. Sorry, Councillor. Thanks. Uh, so I'll just go to the next slide. So the next one talks about our funding framework. So as I said, um, when we're talking about sustainability, I always think about balance. So what we don't want is the scale that's on the slide. We don't want to see our outflows um, exceeding our inflows, where we are having to spend more than what we are bringing in. Um, so it's important, again, every time we're making the decision, we understand what the impact of the decision is in terms of if we are making a decision to spend money, we need to understand where the associated funding pathway is coming from. So we've put a little table in here around understanding what of some of the more normal or I'd say um, more traditional sort of allocations of funding pathways to types of expenditure. And classically from a, from a financial perspective, we always split that between operating and capital because they each have different funding pathways and they each have different impacts on our bottom line. So when we're talking on the operating expenses side, this is just your normal services, you know, um, library services, community services, everything like that. Um, strategic projects that are operational. Um, those, those sorts of things are our normal operating expenses, which consist of, you know, employee costs, it consists of, you know, um, program costs, you know, materials, etc. All of those are funded by our complete income source, not specifically just rates, but our complete income source. So rates, fees and charges, any operational grants and subsidies, etc. The focus on those is that you want ongoing funding to match an expense that is always going to be ongoing. Every time we put a service in place where we're talking about an ongoing recurrent service, we therefore need to make sure it's matched by an ongoing recurrent funding pathway, not just a one-off to an ongoing cost. Otherwise, you will get out of balance pretty quickly in a future year. Um, the, the other key cash operating, um, a cash outflow or operating expense that I really want to focus on is the costs associated with capital expenditure. Quite often we worry about funding the capital expenditure and we forget about the operating costs that's associated with that capital expenditure. So we're talking about putting in, and I'll just set it for round numbers to make it easy, but say we put in a new $10 million building. That new $10 million building on average comes with probably around a $1.5 million operating cost. Right, so that $1.5 million operating cost is what we have to worry about funding if we don't want to run into the situation where we're running out of cash to fund our operations in the future once that, once that asset becomes live. And this is the lag that you might start to see. So when you have multiple years of spending large amounts of capital expenditure, I think we've had around 140 odd million or maybe 100 million less um, grant and external funding. So 100 million over the last five years, have we thought about how the operating expenditure comes into play on that 100 million over the last five years? And have we made sure that that is funded? Again, the funding doesn't necessarily have to be through rates, but it should be through some kind of income pathway, whichever, whatever that is. So income generating asset, it's easy to sort of say it'll be covered by rent or a lease or something like that. If it's a community asset, it's a little harder to find that. And direct income correlation, so it might be through user charges or rates, etc. But it is important that every time we think of a capital expenditure, we think about the associated um, operating costs that come with it. And those are, like as, as I've put them up there, when you're in a borrowing situation, that's interest. It's also depreciation and it's maintenance and any service programs, etc., that will run out of that new building, for example. So they also need to be funded. Um, renewal and replacement of existing assets. So renewals are a operating um, cash outflow, I'll say. So our income, our funding pathways um, in, on the um, income side have to cover our renewals. So that cash flow from operations has to cover our renewals. Um, I'll, I'll go into, um, or if you want, I can kind of flick back to that graph and say those dark lines in our years, this is point away there, the dark lines in the out years where the cash flow from operations is forcing us to borrow is directly reflective of our renewal program being quite large in that year. 
So we don't have enough income and cash flow being generated from operations in those years to fund our renewals. And that's what's starting to show through. I'll show you that in a bit more in a, in a ratio in a second. On the capital, um, capital side, um, when it comes to sort of new capital, the capital expenditure is obviously either on an income generating asset or a community asset. It's my definition of a community asset in terms of a non-income generating, non generating asset. Um, the actual capital expenditure again can be paid, has various funding pathways. It can be paid by the return on the investment over time, which is great. There's obviously external funding, again, which JP will go through a little bit in terms of his levers. Um, there's the future fund, which we've spoken about as well. Um, and if we happen to have surplus cash flow after paying for our renewals, we can also use that. Um, and I think in previous years, if we kind of go back sort of the yeah, to 10 years, you know, when we were in sort of more surplus cash flow operation, um, in cash flow from our operations, that was definitely funding new community assets back then too. But now we're not in that situation and you're in a borrowing situation, you're going to use borrowings to fund that. Again, not a bad thing. Borrowings is a great intergenerational equity tool. It's just going to make sure that we are actually able to repay that borrowing, that's all. Um, so that's the funding framework. Um, so the following, or as I said, the, the slides in the pack, in the reading pack, did explain sort of each component of those as well. So I guess I'll probably pause here with a question if you like, if you're happy to save them to the end, um, Chair, then I'm happy to save them to the end. If you're happy to pause for questions now, that will yeah, be good. I'm happy to do that. That's what I did. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate it very much, your articulate um, presentation. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions, and I don't expect uh, you to have the answers here, but it might be helpful before the matter comes to Council. Um, what assumptions are included uh, in the Ford, um, Ford estimates, sorry, state government term, um, regarding uh, interest rates, so the cost of finance, uh, when, we, when we work out where we might land based on options A, B or C? Uh, thank you, Council. That's right, I'll give it everything <laughs> through the chair. Um, the assumptions around the interest rates were included in the reading pack um, there in terms of the rates. Uh, sorry, I don't have the page in front of me. I think it's on slide 24. Um, so it is based on the current interest rate in the first year, um, and then the rest is a projection based on sort of um, inflation applied to that rate in the forward, in the out years. But the rate is applied to what our borrowing's projections are in the long-term financial plan. So if the borrowing is 130 million in one year, then we are using that interest rate against the 130 million. So the interest cost in the operational side of things is covering the interest cost of the debt level that is projected. Thank you. And may I ask a, a follow up question through you, Chair? Um, uh, for, for many elected members being new to um, the City of Adelaide's finances, um, I'm wondering if it might be helpful and through, through you, Chair, uh, Justin, you, you uh, have history with the organisation, granted in a different role 20 years ago, but um, I'd be very interested to know, and I think it would be helpful uh, for everyone's understanding uh, at the, to the next stage, what happened to asset maintenance and replacement, uh, annual asset maintenance and replacement budget and actual spend in the last 21 years, so since the year 2000, because, uh, and again, for the benefit of, of others, um, in um, uh, the turn of the millennium, uh, council owned and there was a river of gold, uh, the Winfield dump, um, and it had to sunset based on, as a result of state government legislation. And of course that had, a, had an impact. And at that time, and granted that our our gross revenue, uh, operating total operating revenue back then was probably around about half, I'm guessing, of what it is now. Um, we instituted a $20 million a year savings uh, challenge, which precipitated a, a, a significant restructure. Claire, you, you'll remember this very, very clearly as well. Um, and, and of course, you know, that there are consequences to that. Um, uh, but we had to do that to anticipate the loss of revenue that was going to impact us from, from the loss of Winfield um, some further, few years further down the track. Um, 
I think it, it's very, uh, it is, and I promised you, Chair, I'm not entering, this is not debate since I'm the only one speaking, but um, uh, I think it would be just helpful for us all to come to grips with the fact that, yes, decisions taken maybe in the last five years have contributed to deficit positions, but I, I believe there are probably structural issues in relation to how councils well into the past approached asset replacement that uh, have have in fact been a ticking time bomb. Uh, and um, I, I hope that if we had that information, it might be helpful for us understanding a little bit deeper uh, how it is that we got here. Did you want to make a comment on that? Yeah. I'll just make a, a very quick comment, Councillor Mackey. Um, so historically, um, and I think I shared this uh, with, with members last year, we had a very clear approach to asset renewals um, and then um, the enhancement side um, sort of got merged with the renewal side and just became this bucket called infrastructure. And, and as an organisation of the city started to lose a bit of sight around um, what the renewals component um, element was versus what the enhancement was. And so um, from a discipline perspective, I, I think uh, we lost sight of how um, to manage that effectively. I think the other thing um, that um, we've talked about previously as a council um, is when we have, um, for example, um, raised income such as the sale of um, the sale of the Grenfell Street U Park to London Place or income from um, uh, Wingfield, um, what previous councils have tended to do is invest that in um, major infrastructure projects such as London Mall or Victoria Square um, or North Terrace. So there's been a, a previous focus on making sure that um, that you know major projects were a key part of, of, of this city's um, each. Uh, electoral cycle um, and I think what we try to do now by creating the future fund is just bring a bit more um, clarity in the long-term financial plan about where that comes from so it's it's a, it's a mix of various elements um, and I think each each council that's elected has always been very clear and given clear steer to um, administration about where their focus is um, and I guess that's you know what we're trying to do with, with this council um, at the moment and that certainly last year is just try and get um, a clear steer on the priorities and how to make sure financially we're able to fund that. So, Justin? Just a quick comment, just to agree that the um, Winfield dump definitely was a, a golden goose and, uh, and that hasn't been replaced to any extent and there has been a bit of a spending spree on, on big capital items which are fantastic for the city but uh, nothing's replaced that from a cash flow point of view. And the uh, um, long-term financial plan assumptions, if you would like to have a look at that, it's in your pack on page 24 and it shows the interest rate there from 1.5 up to 2% over those years and a number of other assumptions about employee costs and enterprise agreements and super and all the, all the rest. So you find that there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, man. Um, I just a, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a few, just to, to be absolutely clear. So um, a lot of the projects that have uh, landed in our long-term financial plan haven't been in previous long-term financial plans, such as the Weir and the Bridge, um, the U Park, etc. So, um, which I uh, applaud the fact that we're actually looking at that. Um, but that's what happens when you're doing a 10-year view. It's, you know, previous councils maybe it, they should have been doing a 15-year view, and they are one in a hundred-year projects that we have to fund. So, um, the, but it doesn't take into account, as you say, the, the balancing act. So our long-term financial plan doesn't take into account any grants or funding or partnerships that we would do or be looking for with state and federal government. Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor, through the chair. Um, no, it's not. It, it does um, only affect <coughs> like the actual spend through um, the asset management plan. Um, and it just means that the funding is going to be funded through the cash flow operation. So anything then that is secured in terms of funding in those out years 
um, would then be put in as soon as we have that knowledge. But because we don't have that knowledge, we do have a, a bit of a general rule in terms of the planning that we would put in the plan, only those things that we are, are more certain, um, and we won't put anything in there that's uncertain. Yeah, yeah I, I guess um, the point I'm trying to make, and, and I know there's been some coverage on it as well, is uh, I think we are being financially prudent by looking at the long term and looking at those major assets that have to be renewed. As I said, the one in 100 years. Um, perhaps uh, this council who is really looking at uh, long term finances also has to look at, is there anything else in the following 10 years or after that that are major efforts that we should actually be setting aside a, um, a, a different type of future fund, but we didn't ever have a sinking fund. This council has never had a sinking fund. You know, 20 years ago when you were here, Councillor Mackey, they wouldn't have been thinking about replacing the weir or the bridge. So um, I would be very keen through our asset management to look at if there are other major city assets that may be outside of the window that we're looking at now, um, so that there may be a provision that we can do in the long term to look at how we can um, put aside his saving for that rainy day um, through through this process. That's just a comment. Councillor Kira. Thanks, Chair. Um, right. Uh, so on the uh, on the rates revenue that's been forecast out uh, to 2030. Um, are there any sort of parameters around uh, that forecast, um, especially on the downside? Um, so I guess put another way, how are those risk adjusted, um, considering particularly the effect of um, a trend of working remotely, uh, feeding through to valuations in terms of commercial, particularly commercial premises uh, and, their, and their revenue? Thank you, Councillor, through the Chair. Um, the, again, the slide 24 has the assumptions that we put against rates uh, income. Um, so there is the growth in terms of new developments that's been put in. So this is in your reading pack, sorry, not on the presentation, but um, the new developments um, has been growing at, or is, sorry, projected to grow at a rate of 1% over the 10 years. And the rates from existing valuations is expected to live by CPI as well. There is no um, no sort of downside in that. It's just expected to be kind of a low uh, increase over the life of okay. the Yeah. Is, is that especially prudent given uh, the impact on, we're still majority reliant on commercial uh, commercial rates. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily not, but you can appreciate there will be a, uh, concern, a generalised concern from the top that we may face a, a decline in valuations and commercial premises because of the remote working trend. Um, has that trend been factored in? Are there reasons to believe that trend will uh, reverse? Or through the chair, um, at this stage we have called it out as a risk, in a risk in the paper. So under the rates on slide 12, we have called it out as a risk that if the current market conditions continue, then there will be pressures on our rate base in the future. Yeah. But there's been nothing built into yeah, that so it's, today. It's, it's not, not, risk, not risk adjusted, those numbers are not risk adjusted for that fact. Okay, thanks. Um, I think um, because increasing the rate in the dollar is going to be um, amongst the public um, constituents and stakeholders extremely unpalatable, um, zero, less than zero appetite for it. I think we um, are in a situation where we have to have a drive for efficiency. Um, do you have data or is it available? Do you think is it conceivable to get data on other capital city councils from around Australia? Uh, can it be determined which is the most efficient? Uh, can we get figures on their fundamentals, that is the income and expenditure? Um, and can we find out how they compare to us and whether uh, any of their uh, methodologies uh, can be emulated uh, with this council? Um, thanks, Councillor. Through the Chair, I, there is benchmarking data available in terms of we can go and look at the financial statements with other capital city councils. There's only so much value you can get from them, though, um, in terms of the detail that is provided in them. Um, to, to do that effectively, you would you would want to sort of do it on an interview basis and, and really sort of sit with each council and, and go through that exercise, having going through a benchmarking productivity inquiry with the Productivity Commission before. It does um, 
get uh, a little onerous when you when you kind of try and compare apples with apples when every city is different. Um, but there are some common conclusions that you could draw if you just stay at the higher level. And we certainly could, could look at doing that exercise if we think of it about value. Look, I think at this juncture, without it being a, an expensive undertaking, I think I think councillors would find it uh, useful, if possible, uh, because we're making some pretty serious decisions about the long term, uh, to determine the scope of uh, future efficiency within this council, uh, if we had some uh, comparisons from external bodies that are essentially undertaking much of the same, uh, much of the same services. So. Thank you, just all be mindful uh, through the chair. Um, Councillor Moran? Uh, yeah, look, just going back to the past, uh, we did replace the King William Street Bridge when Sue um, Munro was Drew uh, Munro, and we also replaced the gates on the weir. So I just want to correct this um, misbelief. All the pavers were replaced, the undertowing was done, all the wood was replaced on the bridge, and the gates were replaced on the weir. So it is not true that we have not done that. In fact, I heard in a meeting here that um, the bridge had not been touched for 100 years. That's just not correct. And we spent a lot of money on it. Alfred Wong was a little man, you were here. Um, Justin, it might have been before your time and Sandy's time, but there was a lot of debate then whether we should spend that much money. And there's a lot of debate in the paper, we'll look up the paper, whether we knock the old bridge down into the modern one, which would be a lot cheaper than repairing it. So. It, it's not in that. It's not in as new condition, but it's pretty good. Did you want to clarify anything there, no? Councillor Sims? Thanks, Chair. Um, in terms of feedback, I guess um, I would be well. I'm not supportive of cutting um, services or infrastructure um, as a way of uh, dealing with the situation that we face. Um, I, I recognise, obviously, COVID-19 um, has changed the dynamic, but I also don't think any um, councillor ran on a platform of slashing services um, or cutting staff or um, slashing infrastructure projects. Um, my view would be if the council wants to do this, it needs to actually have proper consultation with um, the community around that, as I've consistently argued um, ever since I was elected to um, council. Um, I, I guess I, I have some concerns as well around the assumptions that are being made here that reference constantly to bad uh, debt. I think one of the things that's really interesting that's come out of COVID-19 is the fact that you know levels of government are recognising that debt is perhaps necessary at the moment as a way of ensuring that um, we're able to provide support for the most vulnerable people in our community and recognising the role that the City of Adelaide plays you know, as a major employer as well in this state. We've already cut uh, significant numbers of staff. So I'd be very concerned if as a result of this workshop, there was to be a view that we're going to just cut community services and uh, cut staff as a way of dealing with um, the difficult financial situation. Um, my view would be have a community consultation, but also talk to other levels of government about whether they can provide us with some support as well. Um, and I don't think, you know, aiming to get into sur surplus at the moment um, and, you know, cutting um, services to get us there is a appropriate ambition. Um, I don't think that any other level of government is aiming to get a surplus at the moment. Um, we're not a, a business, we're a level of government. Um, and I think we have an obligation to uh, provide services to the community. So that's my feedback. Councillor Martin. Yeah, um, thank you very much um, for that uh, presentation. That is the most cogent uh, account of our circumstances that I've seen in a while. And it, it is illustrative of just how toxic it is when you overspend to the extent that we have been uh, $3 million a month currently, you actually then start to curtail your ability to do things, in, including uh, maintaining assets. But look, I have a couple of questions. And the first is, could somebody explain to me where this $20 million cost of COVID comes from? I had a look at pages 4, 14 and 38. The best I can come up with is about $9 million. But I'd love to know where that 20 is from. Could I have a, an explanation of what makes up that 20 million? Are you able to answer that? 
Gross or Julie? Well, I think the administration knows because it's in our paper. So I'm just giving her the opportunity if she can answer it and then I'll ask. Well, the acting CEO. One moment, Councillor Martin. Great. Thank you, Councillor Martin, through the chair. Um, I believe you're talking about the $20 million savings target as opposed to the cost of COVID? Or no, is there no, no. If you go to page four, it says that our position is affected by, um, uh, let me take you directly to the quote. COVID-19 and the loss of other income, predominantly parking and rent, in the order of $20 million in 2020. And yet when I look at the, the income tables um, and the explanations and the comparisons, I can only find about $9 million. I'm just wondering where the risk comes from. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sue Chair. Sorry, I have to work through that detail, but I'll pass over to Nicole. She may have given more of an answer for you. Yes, uh, through the chair, that um, $20 million is from 2019-20 through to 2021. So in 2019-20, when the pandemic started immediately, in QA3, we reduced our income down and the loss we occurred in, in 2020 financial year was in the order of $20 million. Sorry, so you're saying two financial years. That is the initial impact in 2019-20 um, and 2021. Correct. So the, in 2019-20, we lost $20 million of income. We are still recovering. As we're still within the pandemic, we are still... Oh, no, so I understand. We are yeah. assuming to be back to 85 to 90% from 2021. So it's not directly attributable to one financial year, it's to God. That's great. Um, my other question relates to um, the calculations in regard to uh, interest rates that we are predicting and uh, it does clearly show uh, variations between about 1.5% and 2%. But I'm just wondering, do, where does that calculation of 2% come from? Because I know that other organisations like the OECD do forecasts on uh, Australian interest rates, not so far as 29, 30, but nevertheless, certainly around the 26. So what, what do we base our 2% on? Um, through the chair, it is flowing on in line with our inflation assumption. So the market rate, the interest rate and the inflation move together. So we've got forward predictions based on the um, state and federal budgets and we're utilising that to forward predict our, the market rate of interest. And we assume that they rely on other sources, including the okay. Okay. Um, and, and when we talk about um, uh, the um, asset plan and the, uh, the projects that we've included in there and and I might add I just wonder about the sustainability in the terms of the definition of page four or put all your capital works into the end of the decade in fact halfway through the term after the next council um, uh, when in fact I think uh, there's one year in, in 30 when our borrowings are the exact amount that we actually receive in rates. It's 100% of rates. But nevertheless, um, is that really a complete list? I, I know there's a qualification that says the infrastructure doesn't include any of the Central Market Authority capital works. And I think we've had the Central Market in here saying that there would be 18, $20 million worth of works to come. So that's not in there? There's, there's some in there. It's included within the long term financial plan, Councillor. So uh, it says in the document it's not. Yeah, but the subsidiaries costs are recognised within Council's long term financial plans in section 42, so they're in their long term financial plan. Okay, and um, the Adelaide Aquatic Centre renewal, which of course this council that's in here, which year is that in for? It's spread, um, there's asset renewals for the Aquatic Centre spread across a few years. I think it's around 12 or 14 million dollars of renewals. But no replacement. No replacement. So we we can't tell the community we're replacing that. It's just we're repairing it. Well, until the council makes a decision on what the, what they're putting in, and there's a business case and a cost, and um, that wouldn't be necessarily in the long term. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we promised um, the precincts, so Connell Street, Hutt Street, uh, 
um, Melbourne Street, we're going to upgrade them in the next, in years seven to 10. Is that in there as well? Again, I haven't seen anything from council to say what it is they wish, so you might have made a promise, but until council resolves what it is they absolutely want to okay. see delivered on those three streets, it won't be in a long-term financial plan. All right, and just a technical question. At page 26, there's a $43 million gain on defined benefits. Um, I don't understand, can you explain that to me? Uh, can I just be mindful through the chair um, and so we can make sure it's procedural, um, just so we can stick to the procedure, just direct the questions through the chair so we can direct it correctly to administration. Oh, I'm sorry, Chair, I forgot about the look at me rule. That's um, right, look at me. Look at me, look at me, yes. Captain Kim. So, um, uh, Chair, um, can you tell me what is that $43 million at page 26? Sure. Grace? <laughs> page 26 also. Thank you, Councillor, through the chair. It is an asset revaluation. So that is a, um, a result of an asset revaluation, um, which could be applied to general assets across the board or one particular asset. Okay, it has a fairly significant impact on our financials. Yeah. Yes, every five years we do get our assets revalued. So. Okay. Um, all right, look, that's, I think that's my question. So I have one for the chair. Could you tell me at what point in the standing orders it's required that members should look at you as they ask a question? Oh, well, you don't have to look at me, Councillor Martin. I, but I would appreciate if you could just pause and ask through the chair. You don't have no, to look at me if you don't want to, um, just so we can make sure that we can give the admin the, the ability to be able to ask that question and who can directly answer that question for you. No, I'm, I'm asking what is the procedural um, requirement can, can in standing orders? Can you answer orders? that? Um, Jenny, Jenny, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. It's a sign of respect to address through the chair for the meeting, and then the chair decides and refers to who answers. No, but I'm asking the, the rules of the meeting are governed by the standing orders. What is the paragraph? That through through that? the meeting regulations and the standing orders. It's regarding principles. I'll just, if you do want to pause, I'll just have a look for you. Yeah, no, no, I think it's a really important point. Sorry, through you, Chair. Can we take that on notice and we'll proceed with the, that presentation? I don't want to hold everyone up for that. Certainly, we have more pressing more important issues to get through. No, no, but we'll I understand, Chair, and I can take the meeting a lot of time. There is no rule in the same rule that is not set track. It is a confection. Yeah. Only formal meetings. Yeah. Yeah, to that. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Um, you know, I can appreciate that in this uh, financial year is the first time we've really um, you know, shown how, how all the uh, all the aspects to our budget, etc. And obviously, there at least no more surprises in the ten years. But I think it is important that we do stretch that out because a lot of things uh, um, do need to be uh, you know accounted for over the longer term. If they're going to last sixty to hundred years, then we need to slowly work that down because that's not money that's yours that belongs to the future. And if we, at least we need to be aware when we're doing things that uh, we are tampering with that. And I think I can appreciate the business as usual. Um, component that we have and, and, uh, and but I do realise that in the past that we've um, uh, had support from state governments and other sources for things. Is there a way that we can sort of say well here's this, this is what we've got now and but you know when we talk about infrastructure uh, um, you know that we are talking to governments and what have you and saying well you know we need a system this because it is a joint asset in a sense because I mean, it's just a quirk of nature that we we have the ownership of these things but they are delivered otherwise so is it possible that we can um you know have some sort of uh, understanding how 
that uh, conversation happens because that helps us to sort of temper some of these uh, um, concerns that we have. Because so far, it's all in my, you know, all the problems are in our pocket and not necessarily, um, you know, as it was previously. So I thought that that may be a value as well. And and I think we have a lot of discussions and talking about, you know, trying to save money and all that other sort of stuff. But um, you know, we, we know what this is, and, and I appreciate um, uh, that we, we make sure that we account for all the things we normal business by what we're doing normally with the rates that we've got. But we're not. Uh, in, but again, we also need to be talking about what other opportunities we're going to have, because the biggest deal is is that we can't keep going up with our costs. But what is it we are going to deliver as a, as a council that people are going to want as a service for which our future fund works for? I Meaning we've got car parks, we've got all sorts of things that we need to be thinking about. Uh, not back in the past so much, you know, where they haven't uh, said, okay, this is going to come to an end uh, at some point. What is our what is our future going to look like uh, around that? And so that we start to think about it and start to accommodate them. I think so. That's another stream that, uh, as in our financing, so that it gives us more options that we can think between all of them. And as they become real, that we can sort of start uh, putting them into this, these equations. So because we're able to say, okay, this is where we're going. This is what we're thinking, and it enables us to at least start to work towards some of the the options we have. And I think. That helps to temper because, like in every business, you're, you're continuously reacquainting yourself with and, and looking at what you're going to do. I just think we need to do a bit more of that so that we come up with ideas because you come to us and we need to make decisions. But we also need to start having ideas from whatever source and it can be from other, other jurisdictions that saying, well, they do this and they do that. What is that we can do um, that is going to help us? Because Adelaide isn't the other, in other cities. We've got parklands that we spend a lot of money on. We've got all sorts of infrastructure that is unique to us. Um, and we, somebody, in some way, we have to account for that. So I think that's a conversation I think we should need to have as councillors, with some guidance about all the ways we can we can provide service or, or some value that someone's going to pay for. I think if we can do that, then that means that we have one conversation about okay, this is the worst case scenario. Okay, we'll do this, and we then move on with the rest. Any comment? Um, certainly, councillor, in relation to uh, partnership projects or funding from federal or state government. So members would be aware that we try and bring through a forward plan of infrastructure proposals to um, enable the Lord Mayor to advocate and lobby at both the state and, and federal level. Uh, the other opportunity that we do regularly is um, we line up um, projects um, in conjunction with the electoral cycle. So um, we usually come into the chamber and workshop um, with, with members um, what those priorities are uh, with a view to um, hoping that um, politically um, you come out better after an election depending um, who is in government. So um, those types of um, processes are already in place. Um, I think what we have um, tried to do um, this year in particular um, is at least um, bring some uh, clarity and transparency to what it is that um, you as council members are responsible for um, and um, any opportunities to obviously um, get any external funding is always welcome but at a minimum this is what it looks like anything else is over and above and we're obviously very grateful for it. Um, you raised some other comments which I think Grace you just wanted to add to. Thank you, um, Councillor, through the chair. Um, so so there's, it is important to understand that this is 10 years and in the context of Adelaide's history, it's a very slim view in terms of time. Um, and, um, and again, when we're talking about intergenerational equity, it is just a slim view of what a, you know, sort of a standard 30 year kind of generation. So um, it is important to understand that there's life after this and that there's a rolling 10, plan, um, 10 year plan. Um, I think one of the, the key things to understand about the long-term financial plan it is it is a baseline assumption. It assumes um, essentially what we are doing now will remain and therefore we'll take that into the future with other known or certain changes to it out into the future. So it is a projection and it's a projection that is loaded with assumptions. Um, the one thing that is going to be new for this council this year is we will have a separate long-term financial plan written document that is going to be independent of the um, business plan and budget. Um, so it will be a document that will go through in depth and detail a lot of the assumptions that are made in there, particularly with regards to um, 
uh, sort of those assumptions around market adjustments for rate valuations. Uh, we can also put in there the context around uh, assuming no external funding in the out years, um, the fact that we've set up the future fund, what the type of future capital spend is. We can document that all throughout the documents. It won't be just a set of financials. It will be an explanatory document as well, so that way people can understand and interpret the financials and the assumptions that have gone into that as well. So um, it will be a standalone document that will be included in the consultative pack that goes out with the business plan and budget and um, uh, asset management plans. So, um, so that's probably all I really wanted to, to add to that. Um, I guess there is just one more slide with regards to the dashboard. I guess I'm assuming I can take that as read. I did want to point out that there is one new ratio that I've put in there this year, which focuses on that cash flow from operations. Um, as I indicated in the other slide, it is it is sort of the only one that is indicating that it is um, read in the out years, suggesting that that cash flow is not there. But again, the document can support that um, assumption with the fact that there's no external funding reflected for those um, asset renewals. So we are assuming that the asset renewals will be completely funded out of cash flow. Um, I guess I'll reiterate the point where I first started. A long-term financial plan will always put those projections out in the future years and will always look nice and green because we assume either um, we're not adding anything further in those out years or I prefer to view it the other way, is that every decision we make in those out years is a balanced, sustainable decision and therefore keeps us in those ratios. So that's my aim um, and I hope it is the councils as well over the next um, 10 years um, to make sure that every decision we do keeps us within those ratios and keeps us in that green position um, for all of our ratios um, going into the future. So that would be a, a nice, balanced, sustainable budget that we could put forward from a long-term perspective. So. Unless there are any questions, Chair, I'm happy to finish up. Any other questions, councillors? No, did you want, was there anything further you wanted to add? Or? Just the next steps. Uh, yes, yeah, so sorry, just the next step slide. Um, as this is probably consistent throughout everything um, in terms of some more conversations that we'll be bringing back to you with regards to some of the strategic projects. Um, subsidiary business plans, just cognizant that they'll still be around in the context of the 21-22 financial year, but any decision you make around those will directly impact the long-term financial plans. The long-term financial plan is based on the assumptions that we've given you, and you know, I've had some questions about those tonight, but I guess my broad takeaway is that I will be leaving those assumptions as are, and I'll just put in more some explanatory notes in the written document around them. Um, the, um, the future decisions that will come in the next uh, sessions of council in the next month or so uh, will be some decisions around those subsidiaries and projects and services, etc. Again, any decision you make will, will impact next year's budget and that will be the first year of the long-term plan. So it will affect the long-term plan um, for every decision that you make. So. Thanks. Um, just a quick question about um, that process. If this is going to be a long-term um, financial plan and the budget decisions that we make this time will then set the course for the next you know, 10 years, um, what uh, consultation process will be adopted um, and what will be done to ensure that we get um, a higher level of um, buy-in um, given you know, it's going to be much higher stakes um, than, than usual. Um, thank you for your question, Councillor Sims. Um, so, so last year we um, trialled and tested a new ways to engage the community and um, I know um, some council members did provide feedback to say that they were still disappointed with the level of engagement when in fact we as an organisation, um, I think we reached over 100 pieces of um, feedback from the community which was, um, you know, compared to the seven or eight formal letters that we've had in previous years, we were um, quite thrilled with. Um, Matt's going to be here later um, and I'm sure can talk more fulsomely on some of the ideas that he's already put in place. But we want to um, continue to grow the community education piece 
um, particularly for um, our residential and commercial ratepayers, um, to get some um, clear guidance from them around what they value. We started that conversation with them last year and we're building on that. The intent is to build on that this year. Um, through the um, also through the work that Megan had shared with you last week, that's also good data and insight um, from our residential, in particular, ratepayer base around what they value. So we're building that into an ongoing dialogue with the community. Thank you, through the chair. Um, just just a question, really, because there was some um, coverage of our asset um, expenditure today. Can, can I just ask the the, the uh, forward uh, long term financial plan, which is you know around the six six hundred million um, investment? How does that compare to say the previous ten years in terms of cap, uh, of council expenditure on assets renewal programs? Uh, thank you, Mayor, through the chair. Um, so the previous ten years um, in terms of um, Capital spend, sorry, did you want that particularly just on renewal and replacements or were you looking for new and upgraded as well? Uh, probably um, together in terms of what we've been spending over the last 10 years. Sure, thank you. Um, so the total capital expenditure over the last 10 years has been 582 million. So that um, is split 301 to new and upgrade and 281 between uh, for renewal and replacement. So, and so is that sort of fairly comparable to the yes. long-term financial plan that we've got in place now? Yeah, I do believe so. I think the next 10 years that's up to 660 million. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Through the chair, just one point to clarify there, Lord Mayor, is um, the 660 that's been referred to in the media actually includes a number of our, our other capital um, spends as well, like IT plant and fleet replacement as well, to the tune of about $80 million across the next 10 years. So you'll find that the actual infrastructure spend is 580 so for the next 10 years. Very comparable. Yeah. Um, is that a, Councillor, is that a Councillor Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, can I ask the administration if um, in, and it's very important we have that consultation process that Councillor Sims is talking about. But if I ask you to reflect on the last budget consultation program, we had placed into confidence a significant issue related to staff redundancies and a reduction in services. And so it didn't become part of the consultation. And I think that should have been part of the consultation. It could have been a generic admission that that was on the table. But of course, by the time the matter became public, um, the budget consultation had concluded. And so people didn't have the opportunity to have a full picture or to make informed comment. And so I, I ask if during this process, wherever possible in the lead up to that consultation, that we try not to place things in confidence, put them on the table, uh, with whatever limitations there are on, on detail, but put them on the table. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I disagree, Councillor. I think we were quite transparent with the community around what the potential in impact that 20 million council decision that was placed on the organisation could mean. Um, so we shared um, a fair bit of information with the community. I think there was particular questions in relation to um, when we were prioritising uh, those services with the community online. Uh, I'm pretty sure, but Matt, you might need to confirm for me that we actually asked them around that 20 million and where it should come from. We were transparent to say there is a $20 million but reduction. We're coming. talking across purposes. Oh. Uh, um, so which was the I, confidential? I, I, you're talking uh, absolute um, the truth in relation to that. Right. I'm talking about the allocation of 14, 15 million dollars for staff redundancies, um, and, and that was the issue that ratepayers took issue with. Uh, that there was no sign of, of that at all. Yes, there was, Councillor Martin. No, there wasn't. It was confidential. Uh, there was, and we explained that. 
Um, we had a um, line called transition cost of 40 million. We explained that was for potential redundancies. And I have a feeling, Councillor, you did ask us um, how we arrived at that 40 million. And I remember, I'm pretty sure I was sitting in the same chair that I am tonight explaining that that was taken as an average based on average tenure, based on average number of staff. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do think we had that on the. No, no, yeah. subsequently, yes, we did talk about it. I'm just saying in that okay. consultation. All right, I'll take all feedback on board. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Thanks, um, Chair, just some further feedback. Um, one of the things that I think would be really uh, good to include in the consultation is this question around rates um, and whether people are willing to um, make more of a contribution um, to uh, cover you know, key services. Um, and what that means. So I think that'd be a really useful thing to talk to the community about. Um, and also to have direct conversations with um, residents about, you know, if we are talking about cutting services, what that means and to get their feedback. If we are talking about further reducing staff, what that means. If we are talking about, you know, not um, progressing infrastructure projects like um, the master plans and so on, what that means um, and to get their uh, feedback on how they would prioritise. Um, because I do worry that, um, and it's not a, um, I want to make it clear, I'm not being critical of the work that administration is doing. It's been the direction of the council that's the problem, not the administration. But I do worry that the um, way in which the um, consultation has been structured in the past has been fairly narrow and there hasn't been the scope to kind of have those really direct conversations with people about the um, some of the challenges. Just to be clear, Councillor, it seems you're talking to residents only. Want that clarified too, or do you no, mean also? No, not not just residents. Um, Ratepayers, the whole you know, the city whole of Adelaide community, community. As a total. And, and I, I take on board the um, point that the CEO, uh, acting CEO, has made regarding the increased uh, participation in the last budget consultation, and I, I do really um, welcome that. And I acknowledge the work that was done on that, but I still think 100 people is actually a very low, um, you know turnout, certainly better than what we've had in the past, but um, it is a pretty low participation. Um, and I think we've really got to look at how we can involve, you know, key stakeholder groups in these discussions of people who have got the expertise in the community and who represent different constituent groups. Um, I'd be really, really keen to hear their feedback on some of the um, scenarios. Agency I would just make a couple of comments. One is um, we did test with our community last year those recovery principles and number I think it was number two or number three that came back was that people were willing to pay more rates because they valued the services that they were receiving from the City of Adelaide. So, you know, we, it's really challenging for us as administration to have conversations with the community, provide the feedback, but then it's, you know, it's hard to keep that conversation going if there is an appetite politically for us to, to help have that conversation. Um, when it comes to um, prioritising where we spend our money, there's some really simple easy tools that we can do where you might bring um, you know, representative sample together, um, give them $100, put your services and projects on the table and ask them to prioritise it. We, we can certainly include um, Things like that, if there is a value and merit. Um, I know, Councillor Sims, you have um, put various motions in the chamber which haven't necessarily resulted in the type of engagement activities that you would like. Um, and so, from a, my perspective, is there value in us pursuing that from a resource if really, you know, the chamber isn't um, open or keen to pursuing those types of things? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Acting CEO. And just to be clear, I'm certainly not being critical of um, what your team has done. I acknowledge that. I have put motions in the chamber that have not been successful. Um, my, my comment is more, um, well, directed, I guess, at um, some of my council colleagues who might want to think about how um, that uh, can be approached in the future. Um, because, yeah, I think. There, there are examples of um, this framework in other jurisdictions and interstate, and it strikes me that the city of Adelaide um, is, you know, well positioned to be able to, you know, do some of these things, particularly when we're dealing with challenging 
issues like this, it's often said there is no appetite, you know, to do X, Y, Z, even when feedback from the community says something very different. Um, so it would be good to, um, you know, have the scope to bring more people into the conversation. Is it all councillors? No other questions? Um, we're going to the next um, item. Uh, 3.2, I think it's, uh, we still have Grace and Nicole. And Matthew. Thank you. Um, through the chair, then we will split this um, workshop into two stages. So I will go through the draft 2021-22 20, 20, budget, and then I will hand over to Matthew, who will then talk around our services and our operating activities. There is an activity um, to get everyone off their seats and up around, so I look forward to get excited for that. Um, so the 21-22 um, business and business plan and budget is based upon the parameters set by Council on the 15th of December. So in order to enable the preparation of the 21-22 business plan and budget, Council adopted expenditure and revenue targets based on a rate in the dollar freeze and a rise in fees and charges at CPI. Specifically, total rates revenue target of not less than 121.1 million. So what that basically means is that our increase in our rates revenue is come, going to come through new developments only and any market adjustments in relation to property valuations. Our total fees and charges revenue target of no less or not less than 73 million. That is a, based on an increase in line with CBI, which is currently 1.25% and that our revenue streams will return to 85 to 90% of pre-COVID levels by the 1st of July. Based on where we currently are, at the end of January 2021, our income earned is currently between the 85 to 90% 90 compared to January 2020, which that indicates basically that our assumption within the 21-22 business plan budget and ongoing holds true. So we're currently valid and we're talking about valid assumptions. Our capital expenditure is that was noted by Council to have an expenditure on renewal and replacement of existing assets of $27.6 million. This will result in an asset sustainability ratio of 67%. That falls outside the target range of between 90 and 110. We will have capital expenditure on new and upgraded assets of $19.2 million. This will be again be further explored in a workshop with Council in March. The focus of tonight is around the expenditure targets. So strategic projects again based in March is an expenditure target not exceeding $5.4 million. The service delivery is a expenditure target not exceeding $193.6 million. Within this target, a further reduction of $7.2 million has been incorporated within the target. So we originally had a $20 million target. We have found 18 of that. So going forward into 21-22, we will have the remaining 2 million of that plus a further $5.2 million reduction. We will continue this conversation throughout this evening and through the 21-22 business plan budget process. Specifically around the 20 million and the 7.2. So the need to permanently reduce our operational expenditure was identified through the 2021 process where we identified a $20 million target. To date, we have found identified 18 of that. We've realised 6.9 of that this financial year. We will then go in 18. Um, within the transition costs, so um, we had a budget of $14 million. We've actually expended $7 million. So the net of those two for 2021 is a we're currently favourable of 500,000. What that will mean though is that ongoing we will need to find an additional 7.2 million dollars. I think now I'll hand over to Matt. Uh, through the chair and uh, thank you Nicole. In this section um, of the workshop tonight, there are, there are two key segments that we want to walk through. And one of them is um, 
the operating budget by service. So we're going to touch on um, what that looks like with regards to the service directory, um, which was distributed to members on Thursday um, by Justin last week. Um, what we'll then go into is looking at a summary of levers that are available to members for consideration um, as we look to achieve the reduction in operating expenditure that Nicole has, has just mentioned. Um, now, notably, the key questions that you see tonight, we are looking to obtain council members' views um, with regards to what we put up on the screen tonight. Um, we had, um, and we're really keen to just make sure that we give you information so that we allow you to express your views on what we put forward tonight. So we'll walk you through that. With regards to um, the breakdown or summary of our operating budget by service, we're really keen to make sure that council members are aware that as part of reshaping, we've been looking to streamline the service directory and I'm sure council members will remember and I will hold up what was distributed around around this time last year I believe with the services that had the, the 93 services within them which was um, robust and there was a lot of information in this document um, but what was very um, challenging about that document is to be able to engage with our community on, on 93 services that we deliver so we're really keen to streamline that information so that we can clearly articulate um, to our community what it is that we deliver but also the cost in terms of the delivery of those services um, what you see on the screen tonight is a very high level summary of that document where we are looking to demonstrate to our community where we are investing in areas such as parklands and open space roads and footpaths sports and recreation arts, culture and events, to name a few of where we are seeing some of that larger direct expenditure in relation to those services. This also highlights where we see some of our direct income coming from those services as well. So as a summary, um, the key about being able to represent our services in this fashion was really to be able to be outcome focused that our services can be enduring over time. This allows us to be able to do much better uh, performance monitoring and reporting as has been touched on earlier this evening as well. Um, and of course, easier for our community to digest through community consultation, um, some of the points raised earlier this evening too. Um, with regards to the levers that are available um, for council consideration tonight, as we look towards achieving that reduction in operating expenditure in alignment with the parameters put forward, we, we consider these levers to be good business practice at the end of the day and commitments that we have made to council both in August last year, um, but then also in last year's business plan and budget with bringing back those operating activities that were moved into general operations for the last budget. Um, with regards to reviewing our operating activities, we will have that as a bit of a focus for this evening. That's one of the ones that we're keen to get your views on tonight. With regards to um, lever number two being a further review of um, our services, it's really looking at those ongoing improvement opportunities and also looking at community expectations with regards to those services. Um, and that would require an ongoing conversation, not only with council members, but also with our community as we look to look at those services. And the last one on the screen there tonight is around service contestability. Again, we believe this to be good business practice. It's something that was mentioned um, on the 13th of August, 2020 with the reshaping report. Um, we're currently in the process of commencing this piece of work. And we have mentioned it with our um, independent audit committee in February with regards to engaging KPMG to ensure a robust and independent approach. And we are just in the early stages of prioritising those services that may be suitable for a contestability review. And we look forward to bringing that back to council in March, as well as with our independent audit committee at the same time. With regards to our operating activities as being one of the levers, what you see on the screen here tonight 
is all of those operating activities as aligned per service. So you can see what service these operating activities contribute to and the current budget allocation for those operating activities. The following slides that we have are really aimed at setting the scene to facilitate a conversation once we get to the end of these slides to obtain council members' views on where we may be able to look at the funding allocations based on the information we present this evening. With regards to the information that we provided to council members, both in the reading pack and on the screen, um, to be able to get your views on what we proposed this evening, um, we wanted to provide you with the three year average spend for each of these operating activities so we can see what's being spent with regards to the budget allocation and also what a 10% um, reduction to that budget may look like, what a 20% reduction uh, percent reduction may look like in relation to that three year average spend and the current budget allocation. There are some items within here, such as the Free City Connector, where we know there is a joint funding agreement or partnership in place. And you'll see there, based on the customised approach which council members may wish to take when reviewing and, and putting forward their views with regards to these operating activities, that we may wish to hold that funding based on those agreements that we have in place. You'll see on the slide at the moment that based on the scenarios that are on the screen tonight, of which they just are that, that if we were to look at a potential 10% reduction, that the contribution towards the reduction in operating expenditure in that place would be roughly around $700,000. If we were to look at a 20% reduction, we'd be looking at roughly a contribution of around $1.5 million with regards to a reduction in operating expenditure. I'm going to um, pause on this screen for this evening because I think it would be important at this point um, to open the floor to, to receive council members' views on what we have put up this evening. Um, and then also whether or not there are council members' views on any operating activities that they feel that given um, it's been a year since we've reviewed these, whether or not there are any that council members feel that we could potentially stop or look at doing differently in the future. Council members, anyone would like to give any feedback, Councillor Sims? Well, um, it's a choice between two very undesirable um, options, I would suggest. I, mean, I don't want to see a 10% um, reduction or a 20% um, reduction. I, I do recognise the work that's being done though to identify and break that down. I think that, that's helpful for people to understand the implications of decisions that are made on the council. Um, but again, I think we need to have a discussion about revenue. Um, and if people aren't willing to do that, then they need to you know, start to have the hard discussions. But my view would be, um, that I don't want to see cuts to community services. That's been my consistent um, position, and um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know why we would ask um, the most vulnerable people in our community to um, shoulder the burden um, for the current uh, situation. That's precisely what will happen if we cut services um, by ten or twenty percent, as it's been proposed. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, I echo what Councillor Sims says. When you look on the page, a 10% reduction will give us a $771,000 um, increase. The 20 will be one and a half million. It's a drop in the ocean. And these are the things that we value. Personally, if I went through, I could probably put a few reductions on Christmas in the city or you know, things like that, New Year's Eve. Don't question this. The Vogue Fashion Festival, I think I can pick a few that I'll probably cut even more than 20%. But generally, the gain we get from this is so minuscule compared to the hole that we're in um, that they cause a lot of pain for very little gain. It's the same with rates um, going up. The amount you get from putting the rates up is, is just, it's not going to get us out of any hole. Reducing these, Personally, I'd reduce a few of them, but really my general feeling is reduce none of them because you're not getting, you're not paying a hundred million dollar debt off. You're not getting yourself out of the financial hole at all. You're, and I just going back to the previous argument, 
about people wanting to pay rates. I've met more rates. I've never actually met that person. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm assured that they Rob. exist. <laughs> Rob and uh, uh, Megan Hender were the only two I've ever met. Um, so I think we just forget people don't want to pay more rates. If people to get people to pay more rates, you have to absolutely to absolutely have them have faith in you that you're spending their rates well. Now our community doesn't have that faith um, that we have spent it well. Um, I'm not saying that's that's correct. But I'm, I'm saying that they are critical of some of the over expenditure that we've had. Um, they're critical of Sagora like, Place, which I was critical of. Uh, so they don't have that. Um, we haven't got brownie points there that we, we are a safe pair of hands. So they don't want to pay more rates. Um, and I think we'd waste our time asking them if they do. But these amounts are so tiny for the amount of pain that you would get from reducing some of them, like the heritage uh, management grants, the built heritage promotion of free connect bus. It's just not worth doing it. Justin, did you want to comment on that? Yes, through you, Chair. Um, look, I agree in terms of um, what you're saying, Councillor. The uh, minuscule ones, the Adelaide Prize and the uh, Ghana Wrap things, that, you know, they, you buy them off on a lot of pain there. The customised approach was meant to sort of say, is there something different we can do in those bigger areas? It, the built heritage management grants for a year or so, can we cut that, say, by 50% or the sport and rent grants by 50%? I don't know what the imp impact of that's going to be, but that would make up a significant chunk. Okay, well, that's, that, that's what I'm happy to hear your, your views. That's what we want to get. But the, they are bigger chunks that de defer that for a year give us a bit of breathing space so we get on uh, back on track in terms of a uh, surplus. Well, just to answer that, the, I think the smaller ones are the easy ones to drop, obviously. Um, if you went to your community centre where you're having to tighten the belt, can we have, well, for instance, Christmas in the city. I mean, we haven't done well with Christmas in the city of, from the rate payer point of view, the business people, they don't think it's good enough. Um, so if it's not good enough now, we might as well just cut it even more. I mean, we're not, we're not cutting the mustard now. But to drop things like, um, and uh, Justin, you'd be here when we um, really pumped up the built heritage. Yeah. A lot of trouble with people with their houses on the heritage list. And it's got us out of that hole. Um, and people are using it now. If we dropped it for a while, and I can see your point, we would never get that momentum back. They will say, look, I applied for this in the next financial year, there was nothing in the kitty. So we lose that goodwill. The Connect Bus is the same. We were here, I think, when we brought it in under Alfred Wong's um, Lord Mayorship. Lord Mayorship. We had no idea it would become so popular for the houses to be on that ground. So those big ticket items, um, sports and rep, I'm not much of a sports person, so, but I uh, <laughs> have different views. So it's very different. What, what I'm saying is the grand total isn't that much. It's not enough money to buy the paint. We you have to find it somewhere. I mean, if you didn't buy a, the new fleet at the four year turnover, you'd make a lot more money than that, wouldn't you? So I think we, I, I know that this is always a tug and pull between administrative costs and what councils want. When I first came to council, the whole council was given $30,000 that they could spend. So we sat here for hundreds of hours fighting over $30,000. And these are our $30,000. All these things have been put on by councillors. So I would say don't fall for the administration. I hate to say this. Don't fight among yourselves to lose what we have put in. The administration, not the sackings, I don't agree with all that, um, but they, we must tighten our belt administratively because that's where the big juggernaut of money is going. And I think that we have to take some pain, and I know you have taken some pain and reduced the cost, but not in necessarily a way that I would agree with. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch any of this stuff. The amounts are so, so low. And it's, if Justin's saying that the ones that are little uh, are too, too lower, um, you know, too lower amounts, I would say the ones that are bigger are the ones that people, I mean, every time we talk about the connected bus, everybody goes absolutely nuts. If we started cutting heritage grants, that would that would really hurt us. Councillor Mackey. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, through you, a uh, question to the administration. 
the um, uh, the amounts of the feature into the operation operating activity summary. So, for example, Adelaide's New Year's Eve. Am I right to think that that three hundred and seventy one thousand and twenty dollars that is not inclusive of the cost of administering that program? Um, as in oh, the, 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 the staffing costs for for administering and the overheads that are associated with that. I can see. Is it just the money that goes out the door? Uh, through the chair, yes, that's correct, <coughs> councillor. Um, staffing costs associated um, with projects is usually called out separately. So if there is staffing costs, and over many years we've tried to um, make that very clear. Thank you. Um, if, if, if I might then again, chair, uh, through you. Um, venture a, a, an opinion. I, I am in, I, I'm quite inclined to agree with Councillor Moran that this is in the scheme of things rats and mice uh, and it generates an awful lot of goodwill. Um, I, I know that the purpose of this workshop is about what we're prepared to cut in order to close the, the gap but I, I wonder also and I, and I absolutely understand that the political dynamic and imperative and I support the freeze in the rate in the dollar, but I would question whether there is not, given the circumstances, uh, a cause to pause nearly nearly 45 per cent, I think, of, of our revenue, our operating revenue comes from earned income, not from rates uh, being levied. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. Around about right. Um, and we have the cheapest parking in Australia for a capital city. Now don't panic, I'm, I'm not suggesting we radically jack it up, but we know that we own a, a very significant share of market of, of street car parking in order, since the 1970s, uh, Mayor Roche, in order to exercise a moderating influence on the price of off street parking because the marketplace left to its own devices would probably raise higher. Um, we have uh, I guess, uh, is there, this is a question, not a statement, is there not an opportunity in seeking to redress, address the, the, the gap that we have between our expenditure aspirations and our revenue realities? It, is, is it not time to pause and think, okay, from a behavioural economics perspective, there are certain things that will actually help make us a better city in the future. Um, one is, uh, of course, understanding different modes of transport. We are we are completely addicted uh, as a city uh, to the automobile. And don't, again, don't panic. I'm, I'm not anti uh, the strategy that's been in place for 60 years, uh, 50 years. Um, but might we not consider what some what some scenarios look like of a 10%, 20%? increase in those off-street car parking costs to leverage a, um, a benefit. There is of course a disbenefit because those car parking spaces exist to support the, the access of customers to our city businesses. But if you were given the choice as a city business between a, a distributed uh, cost increase to your customers versus paying, you know, let's say another three or $400 in rates, I would like to know how our city businesses would, would feel. That would be a kind of customer uh, 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 stakeholder engagement that might help build a better understanding about where we can go. Uh, likewise, in relation to, um, again, through you, Chair, likewise, in relation to our, our the regulatory fees and charges that, that we put, and in this case, I'm, I'm actually talking about parking expiations, um, and I know they've gone up quite a bit. Permission to work, speak for another minute, um, uh, hopefully less. I know they've, they, they have gone up significantly over the last decade. Uh, but again, from a behavioural economics perspective, um, increasing exp the cost of expiations helps to encourage more timely turnaround of car parking. Our expiation costs, I remember, were so cheap that people would be happy to bear the expiation because it's still cheaper than the alternative um, option. So I guess I just pose that as a um, as, as a question and um, for, for our collective consideration. Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, Councillor Kira. Oh, I'll take it offline. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, just just to um, add, um, just to add, uh, I, I'm not sure why we wouldn't at the moment continue to borrow to, to get us through this um, difficult period, recognising that interest rates are you know at a record low. Um, and uh, preserve um, existing community services. I mean, my big worry is if we start going down the path of cutting um, grants to, you know, arts organisations, community organisations, and the like. Uh, many of those organisations have already been hard hit by COVID nineteen, particularly the arts sector. I mean, that's been really hard hit by um, the pandemic. And many of those organisations rely on the City of Adelaide to provide um, support. If we start talking about cutting those grants, that would have a disastrous impact um, on that sector in the city, I would suggest. Um, and likewise, a lot of the other things that have been earmarked. I mean, you know, I know it was just an example, but it's there on the, the board in terms of, you know, cutting heritage um, support. I mean, what is that going to do to the brand of the city of Adelaide? Or what are we going to start cutting, you know, support for the parklands or, you know, shutting down libraries or, or whatever? I mean, these things are really vital community services. And to me, to be talking about cutting them simply so we can get back to um, surplus in the middle of a once in a century uh, economic crisis seems to be to be putting um, an ideological view ahead of common sense. Um, I don't know why we wouldn't continue to borrow to get us through this difficult period. That's me. Uh, Lord Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just a couple of questions. Um, in each budget year scenario, am I correct that we uh, have a year-on-year -year increase, um, including on our grants and uh, on each of these budget lines? Sorry, thank you, Lord through the Chair. Um, in terms of these um, costs for the operating activities, they usually are increased by um, CPI. Okay. Which is sitting roughly uh, at the moment. Okay. So, um, and I guess what I'm asking is, rather than um, uh, looking at, you know, across the board reductions, I'm actually keener to have a look at the next bit where we actually look at service reviews. but. If um, what if we actually just capped for a period of time, capped for a year, capped for two years, which means you're not losing the operation of any of these things, you're not losing the grants programs, um, but you're actually saying, well, you know, it's forty thousand this year, and it's also going to be forty thousand next year, and it may well be forty thousand the year after, but you actually just capped the year-on-year -year increases. Um, what sort of savings would that deliver us across the budget? Any idea? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, through the Chair. Um, yes, so, sorry, the 2021 budget has already taken out the CPI off of these uh, operating activities. It's something we've already removed. Um, it's the long-term financial plan that has then reinstated them in year two to, to 10. Um, so, yeah, if, if we were to do that with, with CPI roughly sitting at 1%, you're sort of only talking around that $70,000 mark for the CPI on all of these operating activities anyway. Um, so, uh, but that has already been built into this 21-22 budget. Um, it's whether we wanted to change that, uh, sorry, unless there is a contractual obligation for a CPI increase somewhere. Um, if we wanted to change that in the long-term financial plan without assumption, we could apply that and that would assist in the out years of the long-term financial plan, but it wanted to change the 21-22 draft budget. And, I, and further to that, so thank you, that's that's great for me to understand that. It's, it's also looking at some of these, I guess um, it's not understanding what the impact is of some of those cuts. So, um, you know, so I agree with Councillor Ryan, we used to spend an inordinate <coughs> amount of time talking about the, you know, 11 million or so discretionary money and no time talking about the 180 million that was sitting in the budget, which was always quite an extraordinary thing to sit through. But um, um, in terms of that, I've just lost it, but in terms of the, um, uh, the Built Heritage Fund, for instance, um, um, not saying cut it at all, but is there an ability to cap some of those large ones and understand what the uptake is for a start? We, you know, I don't know if it's fully expended on a year-to-year -year basis. What the uptake is, um, or you know, I'm looking at the big ticket items like the carbon neutral Adelaide or the um, information management roadmap. I, I don't know what 
impact cutting that $2 million would actually have on, on, um, on, on our information management, nor do I know just from this actually what a, a cut to that would deliver in terms of our sustainability agenda. So, um, and I'm not suggesting that we do that, but it, it's, it's really a line by line. So I do go by the customised approach, but the customised approach requires us to really understand what's sitting behind each one and the impact of any cuts to it. Agency. Um, thank you, if I could just make a comment. Thank you, Chair and all there. Um, I guess I, I guess we're at the point where, um, as an as an administration, we're trying to understand where council does have appetite to look for um, some sort of savings. Um, I absolutely understand the concept of death by a thousand cuts is probably not palatable for anyone, and really, um, no one wins. Um, in terms of impact of um, of uh, cutting a discrete program such as the IM roadmap, um, we can absolutely share what if that was paused for one year, um, what the implications of that would be. Um, obviously, there are projects already in flight in relation to the roadmap, but we can certainly take that um, offline and bring that back to members next month when we come back to you with a bit more detail around. Um, you know some of the feedback that we've that we've heard tonight. Um, so, yeah. Councillor Canal. I know these uh, conversations are really difficult, but I just, uh, if I'm looking at these as uh, um, activations for the city, et cetera, well, if, we, if we're saying that we have uh, an issue because not enough people coming into town, uh, you know, not enough workers in town, uh, not enough shoppers in town, then we have to say first and foremost is that we, we look at all those things that help and that we can sort of quantify in some way that help generate people coming to the city and using the city and, and supporting uh, the businesses and the services we provide. And if we talk about a library, well, 28% of, of the membership of a library is local and all the rest is, in, is, is outside the city. That's a good thing because you're bringing people into town. Um, so therefore you could sort of say it's an activation that uh, encourages people to use the city so long as that they're coming into a place that uh, we can offer all those commercial aspects to them as well. So if we're just looking at these things and, and we have to say, well, what will assist businesses to keep them you know, viable and bring people to those places and, and really uh, uh, you know, drill down and, and uh, so that there is some sort of uh, um, you know, understanding that, well, these are things we're going to do, this is how it's going to support, and then we can measure it in some way. That then helps us to know what we should be doing more. I mean, we've got our either there and that mean that a lot of these conversations should sit around them because they're the ones that's, uh, that been, we've charged with this. So that's important that somehow uh, they're the ones who've got to put this lens on and somebody has to be driving it. And I think, uh, so that's an aspect because if we support the city and, and, and we maintain and increase the, the amount of visitations, then, uh, then obviously our, they can support the rates and things like that we want to, uh, that we want or need to charge. And, that, and also the, 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 the city as, a, as an attractor for the greater population. Um, so that would be my first comment around that. And, and the individual things I do agree that we can uh, potentially say, oh, we can, we can hold out a year and, and, and it's not going to change you know, people's lives. And they can, you know, some things you can do that. Um, but I think there's a lot of other conversations that we need that um, revitalize our city and, and find other forms of activities that we can potentially support um, that will bring some form of income. And I, I, I note that, you know, the money that we charge for a lot of these large organisations that, you know, for the fringe, etc., you know, we, we don't get a, a really great commercial return on these things, not knowing exactly the, the uh, you know, the, the profitability or anything of the, of the organisations. Um, but is there a way we can do things very targeted that will give us a better benefit while still contributing to the, uh, the viability of the city. So I think there's a lot more conversations but drilling down to some would be good and looking at uh, what is it that's going to bring more people in and collaborations with, with other you know, pieces of organisations as well because lots of people have marketing money and all sorts of things that we can all use to actually make the city a better place and, and then hopefully then work on that. And if you have to cut something then that's because we can do that for a year. Sorry, Councillor Martin, I did miss you before, but... Uh, Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, look, I, uh, look, I thank uh, Councillor Noll for his um, business lens. Um, 
uh, which he's applying to spending in the city, but it's really much more complex than that. It's actually about things like our role in terms of helping Ghana people meet their objectives. It's about providing cultural experience, uh, which goes to the reputation of the city. It's about the look and feel of the place with the heritage buildings, which if you start fiddling with that, you then start to really meddle with the fabric of the city. So uh, th this is a much more complex issue, and it, it, it's also got a, a broader lens that we ought to apply to it. And, and that is that on the one hand, um, our budgetary position is such that we are placing the city in debt for at least a generation. Um, we are also unable to undertake any new capital works for at least a generation. Uh, we are also contemplating increasing rates at some level in order to get a 3% increase as uh, the team has proposed. And we are now arguing about, you know, th these things that go to the very fabric of the city, $1.5 million possibly in cuts, which by the way, uh, represents just 50% of what we will overspend this month. So we are actually, you know, putting an enormous burden on ratepayers. Um, I don't support this, and I think there are better ways of delivering the savings, and I think one of them is that we should look internally at what we're doing. And from my point of view, one of the most extravagant things that we've done in the last six months is establish the Adelaide Economic Development Agency, which has just given away $150,000 worth of vouchers, uh, vouchers to have Tucker in the town, which is sure a great thing, but which costs an enormous amount of money to run and it is so costly that that's confidential i can't tell anyone what it is but if we could wipe it out there would be an enormous benefit delivered to our uh, our budgetary position those are really important big decisions that we could be talking about not about targeting the ghana people not about targeting culture not about targeting heritage um, those are the sorts of things we ought to be talking about and this view, uh, I think, would be shared more widely in the community. I really do. Safety <laughs> CEO. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Lord Mayor and Chair. So just a couple of things, um, Councillor. Um, I didn't hear anyone um, around the room say that they specifically wanted to target um, Ghana or or heritage. I think what we were trying to do was just get a sense from, from members tonight whether there was any appetite to review um, some of these projects that have been on our books for many, 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 many years, as Councillor Moran had indicated earlier. Um, so we're hearing from members that that's not a, um, perhaps a route you wish to take, but that's fine. Um, secondly, did you say that the Adelaide Economic Development Agency was confidential? Sorry, what, I just want you to uh, Yes, the administrative costs are confidential. It's covered by confidentiality order. Oh, I'm surprised to hear that because they're... Well, if it's not, I'm happy to tell the meeting um, the administrative costs of the Adelaide Economic Development Authority. Happy to relate that now. I think in that, um, if that's a separate conversation, maybe you need to distribute it to all elected members so they're clear on the position regarding AIDA and if it's a confidential and, and we shared with members the associated savings um, that will be delivered as part of that Adelaide Economic Development Agency set up um, on a couple of times. So. Um, well, look, I, th I thought it was confidential, but it's not. Well, I, I, I don't know what you're referring to. So, as always, you are trying to tread a line which says something's in confidence. I don't have the information in front of me. I'm not sure. You're then asking me whether you can share that. I don't know which bit you're referring to, Councillor. So it's a bit hard for me to give you permission to share something that I'm not well, sure. Well, look, if I write you it down are, on a piece of paper, would you tell me it's like... down, Councillor. So what I can do is absolutely um, take your feedback on board that you feel unable to share with the community the costs associated with the Adelaide Economic Development Agency. There have been some um, detailed reports shared on the public agenda over the last few months since uh, I think June or July when Council first said that they wished to set the agency up. Um, and then certainly um, questions on notice and motions on notice that have been on the public record um, in the last few months as well. So I'm happy to uh, take that 
information and we send that to all members so you have that. Yeah. That will be good. Thank you. Anyone else would like to? Can I make just a few comments? No. Um, well, as chair, I have that oh, right. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. I thought chair um, um, What I'm hearing tonight, it's really interesting. Uh, we're saying no to cuts, no to increase the rates, no, 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 and we want everything to remain the same. I think administration are, are looking for direction in, in which we can flip it and make it work for the whole community. And we're not looking at, um, you know, taking things away. We're wanting to make things um, efficiently and better, and we need that um, direction. So if there's anything further conversations that members can give offline to administration that would be very very helpful so and very much appreciated we there are conversations that um, are difficult to have I appreciate that um, one comment I just do want to make is uh, things like the uh, New Year's Eve and uh, Christmas in the city they are important to the public uh, as we can't diminish them as not being important but is there ways that maybe we can get that supported with the state government as well because it, it does benefit the city um, to traders and to the community overall so there are things that we can look at that we can partner with the state government if we can have those conversations with them so thank you members if there's nothing further we can go to the next item Words in regards to the matter before we proceed further. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, members. The last workshop for tonight um, is to obtain some feedback on the strategic asset management plan approach. So you've heard a bit about infrastructure budgets and asset management plans and, and the like um, throughout the presentations and the workshops already tonight. Tonight. Um, is about the strategic asset management plan and I've heard many of you ask me um, across the last few months what is this strategic asset management plan or as we refer to it the SAM. Um, I guess the easiest way to explain it without referring to a bunch of asset managers with pocket protectors and tweed jackets is um, the asset management plans they're the science that creates the numbers um, the asset management plans are the life cycle management tool that um, we use for council's assets to get the desired performance out of the asset at the most cost effective means for the community. The purpose of the strategic asset management plan is to sit across the top of that and what it does is it turns that science into something that actually meets council's objectives um, of how it wants to manage the infrastructure and it also sets the approach of how we actually deliver the asset management plans for the community and for council. So you've, given, you've been given that outline in your, in your packs tonight. Um, I just want to share with you something. So when I first um, arrived here at the City of Adelaide just over three years ago, um, a fair proportion of council's asset data was in files like this. Um, I think I've got the stormwater data for Gawler Place in here. Oh, that might be Homer Square. Um, it's under H. Um, What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, Councillor Martin, if I could just remind you of the, of the challenge to, um, to uh, you know, try and uh, explain why we needed investment in the asset, in the new asset management system. What I didn't have was access to this um, three or four years ago when Council <laughs> kindly uh, allowed us $3 million to put <laughs> That's right. Uh, so if you can... In an old-fashioned way, it does not necessarily mean that that box doesn't contain some very, very accurate information. If you can bear with me, Councillor, I wasn't diminishing the quality of the information. <laughs> <laughs> it was in paper. 
um, <laughs> to to um, well, I'm allowed to get one laugh. Um, <laughs> to to back it up, that we had 29 separate asset systems within our business spreadsheets, databases, pivot tables, all of these different files. Essentially, what that meant was that we had great asset information, but we couldn't use it for a lot of data that could help council make good decisions. Uh, I guess the reason for showing that is that we now have that. So over the last 18 months, um, a small but dedicated team of nerds have processed and, and reviewed 87,000 assets, um, and they have verified 3.91 million pieces of asset information. So what does it all mean? Um, the data is highly accurate. Um, we can use the data to plan and, and be really precise with what council want. And council can have confidence that um, the different levers that we'll speak to you tonight about can really be modelled with some certainty and we can, we can assist council to make some really good decisions. We've already touched on the um, what was reported in the paper today uh, by Colin James, I think, has joined us tonight, um, around the uh, necessity to spend $660 million over the next 10 years to maintain or replace worn out assets. Um, it's, it's not far off the mark. I think I mentioned earlier when you take out the $80 million of IT, plant and fleet and some other capital business uh, requirements, it's about a $580 million um, forward projection on spend. And as we highlighted earlier, um, that actually matches or is pretty identical to the previous 10 year financial spend. So I guess the message is, this is not new information. The assets, assets have existed, they still exist, and they will continue to exist into the future. Shifting the 10 year plan four years forward, um, has meant that we have to include some of those larger assets in our planning. Council has time to deal with the larger infrastructure investments about seven years before they're, they're realised, but um, those discussions and strategies need to start now. And that's where the strategic asset management plan comes into play. Lastly, um, asset management is not a big stick that forces council to put aside large amounts of money um, to pay for its assets each year, and I want to debunk that, that theory. The assets that council owns are there for the benefit of the community, and council's obligation is to ensure that they perform and provide that right level of service to the community um, for the long term. In doing this, council has to consider how best to maintain, renew, replace, and dispose of its assets at the right time. The way I think of it is good strategic asset management is actually wealth management. So like the decisions we all make at home about cars, bikes, houses, computers that we buy, our aim is to make really good decisions about how we choose, purchase, maintain, upgrade or sell our own assets. If we do it really well, we enjoy the purchase, we enjoy the goods, we replace them at the right time and we're happy to spend the money for the value and the benefit we get. If we do it really poorly, um, or we plan poorly, we don't have enough information, we make the wrong decisions about those purchases. Um, obviously it costs us extra and it may not be financially sustainable or viable for us as individuals. So that's enough from me. Um, JP is here tonight. Sorry. Um, Matthew's here as well. JP's here. He's just going to give a quick two minute um, demonstration of what I just showed you on that blank screen, um, just to show you the level of detail we have in our asset management system, because it sets the discussion up for the strategic asset management plan and how we can talk to you about that. We are seeking feedback on four specific questions um, tonight. Um, just quickly, following tonight, um, members will have a couple of weeks to review the draft strategic asset management plan, a couple of weeks to reach out to staff, myself and the team, to talk through any questions or queries, and then ultimately um, it will come into committee and through to council at this stage on the 9th of March, and what we'll be seeking is approval to take the SAMP out to committee consultation at that time. So that's, that's the plan forward. I'll pass over to JP, he'll do the quick demo and then go into the six or seven slides of presentation material that we have for you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, through the chair, thank you for allowing me to speak here tonight. 
Um, as Clinton mentioned, um, asset management has always been my view about effectively managing infrastructure to, to ensure that intergenerational equality, making sure that um, we provide that as a service to the community so that city can grow and prosper. And prosper. Now, I think that's, that's extremely important. Um, and as mentioned, the 3.9 million bits of information that's been reviewed, that box was absolutely in there um, and uh, provides some good information. Um, to the point Clinton raised earlier, it's about how do we utilize that information now to make better and more informed decisions uh, based on evidence instead of um, relying on people's knowledge and, and, and sort of um, uh, disparate systems that don't necessarily always talk to each other. So it's about creating that efficiency. So um, what you can see here is an integrated map that we are able to utilize now. Um, so for me, in the day of the asset manager, I can look at different asset classes and click on different assets now and actually understand the performance of my infrastructure um, throughout the city. I can filter this information in any way I wish. I can decide that I want to see all the assets that's in a, in a fairly poor condition and then I can also then go from there and actually look at, well, what are those infrastructures actually programmed? And that gives me a fairly good understanding of what we're planning to do over the next couple of years. Um, this is extremely powerful and important for us uh, to be able to make good decisions because that information is then fed into our predictive modeling. Now, unfortunately tonight, I won't have the time to show you the benefits on the operational side, which is about how the customer picks up the phone, gets the work order straight to the public realm uh, or city operations, apologies, and then execute that. But the thing I'm doing here is really targeting on those levers and that information that we need from council and to term to do business different and do things more effectively. So um, here we've got some arbitrary uh, models that was built. Um, the purpose of this sort of slide is to, again, for me as an asset manager, looking at a high level, looking at different things like I can, for example, um, say, um, uh, let's run a scenario where I say, if I spend on my road network, so we're looking at the roads here, $5 million per year. Well, what does that mean in the next 20 years? Well, we can see here, based on the condition that over time, the assets actually get a little bit worse. But more importantly, we can actually see here that we're not getting ahead of ourselves and there's a renewal backlog that's building as well. Um, we can then compare that with another scenario of let's say $7.8 million for that asset class to have a look. And we see we're gonna have a much, much better effect in terms of the condition of the infrastructure, but also we can see here in 2031, we're actually on top of things. Now, is that too much money? Is that too little money? And again, this comes into that discussion on levels of service and, and some of those levers that I will discuss a little bit later. Um, back here, you know, just for, for interest sake as well, this is sort of little photos to indicate also what those different um, scores and, and, and levels actually refer to. So before when I clicked on level four, you know, it showed um, assets that were roughly in that sort of condition. We can do more, um, important things in terms of planning. So I can run the two different scenarios side by side. But more importantly for me as the manager for infrastructure, I can actually look at, well, what sort of um, renewal treatments are required? What sort of treatments do we have to actually do? And we can then plan better. We can get our procurement aligned. We can just become more efficient at doing the same thing. Uh, that, that box, absolutely, Councillor Moreno, as you mentioned, is vital information to help enable a lot of this stuff. Without that, we would not be here today. From that, we then build a capital works program. So what you're looking at here is a three-year capital works program of all different infrastructure. We can click on roads. We can see what are we planning to do next year. We can see, okay, all this sort of information at the click of a button. Now, how does it get from, from that digital asset management uh, modeling all the way through to here? Well, we do things like build um, roads programs. Each one of these projects are actually built based on what we also one of the leaders we want to discuss, which is the resource allocation strategy about how do we prioritize these things. Every project has got detailed information about how much we're planning to spend, um, risk as associated with it, um, impacts, economic values um, and benefits. All these sort of things are considered to end up ensuring that it becomes part of this, this list. We then take it one step further. We look at all the risk profiles for all the asset classes. We then, based on our modeling, look at how much would be, we should be spending in different asset classes. And we can then filter that over the multiple years. Now, that's a really quick presentation to just focus on one element of the capital, capital renewal and capital investment. 
But this system has got so much other potential and it's all based on a lot of information and, and business processes and improvements that was done over the last couple of years. So um, if it's okay, I'll hand back to Clinton to just introduce the, the sample or would you like me to go straight? Yeah, straight into it. Okay, so I'll go straight into some of these levers and uh, click what, this little button here. No, wrong button. So it's right. Yeah, triple okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So some of the questions that I would like to um, uh, get resolved or, or, or answer here tonight um, through the chat is uh, this, what does council members' um, feedback on these different levers being proposed? Um, what are council members' feedback on the draft strategic asset management plan for the belief was uh, provided as part of the documentation? Uh, what's the council's feedback on the resource allocation strategy? So that's our prioritization method. So where ideas can sort of be funneled through and we can determine how we actually build up the resource program. And then also, um, what's the council's feedback on the strategic action, actions to be considered, which I believe is in uh, chapter four of the strategic asset management plan. So moving forward, I would like to talk through each one of the um, these levers in a little bit more detail. Uh, uh, my colleagues from from finance did a great job at, at talking to some of these and so what I'll do is probably just provide a little bit more of an of a example um, in some of these and talk through some of them in a little bit more detail. But uh, one of the first lever is optimization, so renewals and how we can stretch council's dollars further. I think that's that's something that um, really is that power of that optimization and that modeling that I showed earlier. Reviewing and defining our levels of service to find optimal cost. The asset sustainability ratio, divesting and accepting assets, seek external funding, and then as mentioned, the resource allocation strategy. So those are the, the six levers that we really need council's input to take it from a strategic asset management plan and then enabling this through our asset management planning moving forward. So first lever um, around the optimization. So I'll talk you through a, 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 another road example. Um, so this is the a traditional trend that shows how an asset or a road is actually getting worse over time. And what you can see on the bottom there is a timeline over the 25 years we're expecting it to, to last. So in the first five years, when you build the road, it's in great condition, few inspections, people go and have a look at it, but there's no, no real big problem. So fairly minimal spend. So um, for, for the demonstration and, and as an example, um, comparatively, that's around $2 per square meter. As the asset gets a bit older, a few more defects appear, it gets a little bit worse, and we need to do a little bit more to it. The maintenance and operational cost goes down to about $5 um, dollars per square meter per year. At the age of 20 years, we would look at it and realize that, okay, now the risk of this asset um, actually deteriorating any further is going to cost us more money to maintain them to actually replace. And that's what we would want, want to call that optimal intervention. If we decide not to do it when it is $20 uh, a square meter, your maintenance go up by, to $20 per square meter per year. And within that five year period, by sweating the asset, you pay now $100 per square meter, which is five times more for no additional uh, benefit. So you pay five, five, five times more for no additional benefit, and that doesn't include the, the, the cost that can't be attributed to things like the risk and, and those, those other, and impact to council's reputation and other sort of things. Um, so it's, it, this is purely just based on, on capital cost and, and measurable dollars. Levels of service. So this is a, a very, very important, especially when we come to the asset management planning. So per asset class, we need to discuss these levels of service in a fair amount of detail. To date, and everything in our long-term financial plans is based on we assume we're going to replace what we have with exactly what is there right now. So levels of service you can define in two sort of main categories. One is the technical level of service, so legislative, regulatory, um, building codes, you know, engineering things that you have to do when you build or construct these into this infrastructure. Uh, but then there's other things that we have a significant amount of um, input in. So, for example, supply and demand, how much, is the infrastructure fit for purpose, uh, what's the community's expectation, those sort of things. And those are the real robust discussions that we want to have for each asset class and then determine, well, what is that right level of service? 
when you take into consideration the cost um, in that, that will directly impact on our long-term financial plan. So the more we expect, the more we're willing to pay for, the higher the cost, and obviously the other way around as well. The third lever is around our asset sustainability ratio. And um, I think finance has, has mentioned it as well, but um, you know, in summary, it is an indicator that sees whether we are fixing and replacing things at the same rate or not even better than what they're actually deteriorating. And that's, that's what we want to make sure. We don't want to make sure, we don't want the infrastructure to get that bad that we can't afford it eventually and that it's uh, unserviceable. So, as we mentioned before, um, 21, 22, we're aiming for a 67% at this point in time. Now, the impact of not renewing and not achieving that 100% or, or close to that means that there's going to be a significant bow wave of, of infrastructure spend that might be coming our way in the future. And that's what we're trying to avoid, obviously. Level number four is divesting and accepting assets. Um, very simple concept, but um, to um, finance colleagues' uh, point about considering whole of life cost, I think that's extremely important in this aspect. If we get, um, we have to consider unperforming assets which no longer serve as purpose, uh, what we're going to do with that, what's the best strategy to actually divest those assets or get rid of it. There's obviously an optimal time to do that as well, which is important and something that we have to plan and consider for the future. Um, considering the levels of ownerships and responsibilities, so that's a, in around you know doing partnerships with state, federal, or other um, interested parties to share the responsibilities and the management and the operations of some of our infrastructure. Um, some of the examples are Curry Grenfell Street, the Weir, the Breach, traffic signals, and, and our pipelines. Um, determining the optimal time to divest these assets to maximize council's benefit. So that's what I mean. That's that planning element that that comes into it. Um, and then gifted assets. Um, okay, so the best way I can explain it, <laughs> if someone gives you the Taj Mahal, it looks fantastic, it's great, but you've got to be able that you can fund and afford to look after that thing and keep it up to scratch throughout its life. And that might be there for 100 years. So do we have the funding to actually make sure that when we receive these assets, we can maintain and look after them? So gifted assets are sometimes good, but sometimes can be uh, difficult. The other difficulty is also, if we don't have robust uh, processes in place to make sure that the infrastructure that is handed us are of good quality, we might expect it to last 20 years, but it only lasts five, and then who's left with the bill? Well, we are. So it's very important that we get this right. The resource prioritization, um, and this is uh, something where we need to have a consistent framework where any initiative and ideas can be assessed and valued to determine how does that fit into our over, overall plans. Um, first step is how does it align with the strategic plan? How does it align with our asset management plan and our long-term financial plan, um, plan? Does it support economic growth? Is it feasible? Is it environmental or financial or sustainable? And is it ready to be delivered? So those are the sort of things that has a lot of rules and things behind them. And again, we'll talk about those principles when we talk about the asset management plans in more detail about what does council want, what is important, what's more important, how, and how do we funnel and filter this information to, to end up with a score of some sorts that we can rank these different initiatives and projects. Um, also important to uh, note, as um, Grace mentioned um, through the finance presentation, the renewals would need to be funded out of our operational cash flow. Um, and insignificant upgrades are funded through external funding and partnerships to align with our recovery principles. Now, the, the timeframes for the development of these asset management plans, um, at the moment, we think about doing the transportation one first, then buildings, bridges, um, uh, no, sorry, no. got it wrong, transport, buildings, uh, then bridges, uh, then we're going to go to um, stormwater. Yeah, there you go. Parklands. I'll get there eventually. Lighting, lighting electrical. Now, um, it's very important to remember that there's a lot of stuff that we can do in, um, you know, in parallel. Uh, but these things have to be brought through council. There's a massive involvement and discussion, and I can't stress that enough. This is council's asset management plans. 
This is not what I think in my nerds of with patches or whatever kind of dimension. This is this is your asset management plan. So I just facilitate. As Clinton mentioned, it's not about a big stick. We need all these hundreds of millions of dollars. It's about helping council understand the implications of the decisions we're making. And that's my job. That's that's what I'm here for. So um, that's all I have for the presentation. So uh, through the chair, um, I don't know if questions or councillors. Oh, sorry. Um, questions. <laughs> questions. Council, I'll go away and think about this for a while. It's a lot of information to absorb. Um, could we take take the answers to that offline? I mean, 7.30 and I need to read it again before I... I mean, if this is our writing instructions to you to go to Council, I think it's too late at night and too much information for us to... Uh, Councillor Mackey? Um, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, JP, nice to put a face to a name. Um, uh, thank you for responding to a query earlier in the week, um, late last week. Um, the question, I'm, I'm not sure if, if um, through you, Chair, anyone in the administration knows, by comparison, local government, in my sense, sets a far higher uh, threshold about asset replacement than does state or commonwealth government. Is that correct? Uh, uh, through the chair, I, I would, without having the data in front of me, that, that would be correct though. Um, I, from my experience is that local government are at the coalface of the community and definitely have to put a lot more focus into asset management planning um, and long-term financial sustainability around the assets that serve the community as opposed to federal and state governments. Um, um, thanks. Uh, through the chair, thanks, Clinton. Um, would you have a sense of, uh, this is not a trick question, I don't know the answer. Um, uh, do you have a sense of, for example, what the Department of Transport in South Australia might apply as a, as a percentage to the maintenance of its roads? Because I know we, we, we maintain roads in, in the inside of the city of Adelaide. Um, I'm just trying to get a bit of a, a, bit of a sense uh, because certainly in my, my long experience in public administration with the South, successive South Australian governments, um, it is absolutely uh, a far lower um, target than, uh, and it's accepted. Uh, frustratingly, as a bureaucrat, and Aman, I see you nodding, I'm sure you know exactly what I mean, um, but there does seem to be a, a a standard that the LGA uh, has set, which is extraordinarily high. Uh, and um, of course, it helps to keep pushing the investment barrow, the reinvestment and maintenance barrow. But I can't help but wonder whether, and we read, we read stories about gold-plated uh, infrastructure, whether in fact, uh, there is a little bit of a culture that has evolved. I'm not criticising the City of Adelaide's administration, but across local government and probably not just South Australia, but nationally about it. And, and I absolutely, through your chair, take Clinton, you know, your point that there is a lot of community facing assets uh, that people live with on a day to day basis. But um, we, we have a, we, don't, we do we do create a vast rod, a large rod for our own backs. Um, through the chair, uh, thanks for the commentary. I, I do agree. I think um, the thing that is apparent to me over the last, and I think it was about five to seven years ago, when the Local Government Association um, started to bring in guidelines around um, sustainability ratios um, and um, operating in that band of between 90 and 110% is the guide, and that is to, to do exactly that, and that is to make sure that um, local government are renewing those assets um, at the same rate that those assets are depleting. I don't know that state government has those same kinds of parameters Absolutely. to work to. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Brimstead. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm going to be Thank you, Clinton and team, for bringing us into the 21st century out of that box. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple of questions. When you're talking about gifted um, assets, 
is the pedestrian bridge, is that a, was that a gifted asset from the state government or not? Uh, 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 thank you, through Chair. Uh, the bridge is actually not ours. We we couldn't um, get with them on agreement with that. Um, so that's back with them. We are looking after some of the, the um, areas around the thing back there. So okay. <laughs> no, that would be a great example of a gifted asset that we would have to spend a lot of money to look after. Okay, and and, and, and in your experience and in, in the past, have um, uh, federal government or, or state government uh, sort of consulted with us and I guess collaborated with us and worked with us when it comes to those sorts of gifted assets? Um, through the chair, yes, part of our standard um, process is to uh, do everything possible to make sure that uh, the infrastructure that's handed over um, complies with um, certain standards. Yeah. So we, we try to do that as best we can. Okay, that's good. Um, uh, just out of curiosity, I do have a, um, a, a question and it might be taking long. I'm happy to, to take it offline. Um, so getting all that information, um, did you sort of organise groups or gangs to go out and, uh, uh, I guess, you know, get the, um, when I say gangs, I don't necessarily mean <laughs> gangsters. <laughs> It's trade, trade talk. Um, so, did you organise groups to sort of go out there and, uh, I guess, uh, you know, carry out surveys uh, and and put them all into into a database and and that's what we were. Offline, <laughs> no, no, I'm, 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 I'm curious. So, yeah, is that is that how uh, is that how it all came about? Clinton, uh, through the chair, I'll get JP to just provide a quick answer to that. But, yeah, a lot of work went into the data capture and cleansing. Um, thank you. I'll keep it uh, as short as possible. So we have an uh, operating uh, expense of condition audits. Part of that condition audits every year is to also see how the assets are performing. And as you remember that graph and how it deteriorates, so that helps us understand how our assets perform, how it deteriorates over time, but it also helps us validate a lot of the information. We have people at public realm with those tablets now that constantly is out in the field that can correct information and provide information back to us. We've got um, boxes and archives full of as constructed information that's been delivered over the many, many years that we've uh, digitized and put into the system. Okay, the, the reason I asked that was because of the, the budget allocation. So that, that cost is obviously a significant cost, but I can see a return on investment here. So um, um, that cost is um, probably around getting the software together and then also um, uh, auditing the, um, uh, the, the assets and so on and so forth. Am I correct in, in assuming that? Through the chair, yes. It's also the business processes, educating people and training people and bringing in uh, new industry standards and practices into the business. Um, so the, there's a lot of business transformation that happened as part of this project. The software element and the cost there and converting that information, absolutely, that was a big part of it. But it's more about changing the way we do business to become more efficient. And that change management process is also um, expensive initially, but uh, Hopefully we get the returns, or we will get the returns. Okay, and just one final question if I can, Chair. Is, is there any artificial intelligence um, affiliated with, with that? I know it's that field. Um, and the reason I ask is, uh, you know, are we uh, going to be able to, I don't know, maybe in a few years' time, uh, are we able to then see certain patterns or where we're better off investing uh, to um, bring down our sort of long-term maintenance liability? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, through the chair, um, that's that's absolutely the, the idea. Understanding trends, uh, analyzing the asset performance, um, doing all those sort of activities to understand the how the assets are performing, how does it compare with the levels of service set by this council, and then how do we perform uh, our role and making sure that it's done in the most cost-effective way is absolutely the main point of what we're doing here. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and it, sorry, Chair, just one one uh, last uh, bit of feedback. I'm, uh, I'll give you guys feedback off, offline. There's a, there's a fair bit that I um, um, that I want to cover, but I think it's important for us as a council to note that um, there are certain elements that we look at and we label assets. Uh, not from from my perspective, not everything is an asset. There's there's stuff out there that's probably a liability rather than an asset. The aquatic center is, uh, is is one, but uh, that's again my my perspective, and I'll be happy to sort of take this offline and give you guys some uh, some feedback. Thanks.
Councillor Martin. Yes, and I dispute that. I, I actually think the aquatic centre is an asset, uh, not only to the city, uh, but to the, uh, the state. Um, look, uh, the irony about all of this is that that is clearly the, the most superior asset manage management system I have ever seen. But at the same time, uh, we are unable to provide the funds to enable us to meet the guidelines for asset sustainability ratio until 2024. And, and that is a problem, largely because of our overspending by $3 million a month. But this raises, again, the question that comes up in every council, and that is the extent to which this city should be responsible for the maintenance of major assets, including the road system. And, and uh, I uh, have participated in these discussions on many occasions, probably only a fraction of the ones that Councillor Moran has, and we all sit around and say, wouldn't it be great? Now, it is time that this council moved forward and resolved to ask the state government to consider its relationship with the city of Adelaide and its responsibility insofar as the funding of infrastructure is concerned. And it would be a prudent measure, and I'm happy to do it, and I'd love to have everybody's support. I am happy to move that we invite the Auditor General or some other uh, independent agency in to review that relationship with a view to determining the fair funding of the assets that the city holds. It has to be done. We have just mucked about for years, and this session constitutes yet more mucking about. Let's just move forward, do what has to be done in terms of asking the state government to do what every other state government does in every other place, that is maintain major infrastructure. Yeah. Round of applause, Councillor Martin, all <laughs> part of the agreement. I think we should end on that note, don't you? Everybody's happy. <laughs> okay, any other questions, yeah. Councillor? Oh, discussions? Councilor. Just one question through the chair. Um, what's the proposed governance of the resource allocation strategy? Jamie? Happy to work through that with council. Um, at the moment, we've got um, a draft and, and what we um, can do within, you know, that makes logical sense from engineering and a, an Apache elbow uh, nerdy perspective, but um, there is obviously political lenses and commercial lenses and other things that we be taken into consideration to put across that as well. So um, at this point in time, I'll have to take that on notice. I don't know the, the, the answer right now. Thank you, members. I think this concludes this evening. Um, can you continue like to wrap up? Sorry, through the chair, I'm just noting the volume of material. Um, as some members have pointed out, happy to accept any questions or emails to myself, Matthew Morrissey, or JP across the next couple of weeks. I encourage all members to actually um, approach the administration and discuss this in detail with them and give you the thoughts. Um, your feedback is really important um, and uh, and uh, happy on the petite.